MLS package. We'll have live coverage here on C-SPAN 2. And right now we're going to take you back to the House Rules Committee hearing on Defense Department and Emergency Supplemental Appropriations. Members just returning from a couple of votes on the House floor on suspension bills. Not put off till tomorrow what ought to be done. And in the end, uh, listening also to the debate and conversations today, I was very struck by the fact that there was no disagreement on any point of any of the amendments that have been put forth before this committee today. Whether it is the frost Mirth Amendment, whether it is the elements of the Obie Amendment, or whether it is the thrust of the amendment on behalf of the members of New York. What is in dispute is timing. And the word when has been used, uh, next spring has been used, additional supplementals have been used. And I would argue in all sincerity that time cannot wait. 35 days ago today, seven weeks ago today, I appeared in this very room and asked that the amendment I bring before you today be made in order to the economic stimulus package, and that is to provide $2.4 billion over three years to save the domestic steel industry. I thought it was an appropriate amendment to the fiscal stimulus package. Today I come before you because I think it is even more pertinent to the package before you, and I say that as a member of the Defense Appropriation Subcommittee. On August 26th of this year, President Bush said, if you're worried about the security of the country and you become over-reliant upon foreign sources of steel, it can easily affect the capacity of our military to be well supplied. Steel is an important jobs issue. It is also an important national security issue. I emphasized seven weeks ago today when I was here that in all of my experience over a decade and a half as a member of the Congress, I never needed your help more because the domestic steel industry and our reliance on it was imploding and it was an industry that was hemorrhaging. In those five weeks subsequent to my last testimony, I would point out that my comments, I think, have been proven true. USA Metals in Texas has subsequently declared bankruptcy. Acme Steel in the state of Illinois has now ceased all operations. Geneva Steel in the state of Utah has ceased operations. An LTV corporation that was already in bankruptcy has now filed to protect its assets. They are one step away from ceasing operations. This is a national defense issue. It is an urgent issue that needs to be addressed today. The fact is, uh, President Bush initiated a 201 investigation of illegally traded steel, and that is the first presidentially initiated 201 investigation in 16 years. On October 22nd, the day before I testified before this subcommittee, the ITC, comprised at that time of three Republicans and three Democrats said there is serious injury that has occurred to this industry. And Mr. Chairman, uh, all of the members have a packet in front of them and one is relative to LTV Steel where the observation is made that nearly 50,000 retired Americans may lose their health benefits. That doesn't include the 2,700 people that happen to be at that one plant alone in the first congressional district. Someday, somehow, we all are going to end up paying for this economic catastrophe, as well as endangering our national security by losing our control over the domestic capacity to produce steel. And I do implore you and I implore the members of this subcommittee to please allow me, please allow like-minded individuals to debate and have a vote on the floor of the House. And I would conclude by emphasizing that this is a matter of extreme national importance for our defense. 
but it also is very pertinent to individual American citizens. And I think when we look at a statistic that 27,000 people have lost their job in this industry and in related industries in the last two and a half years, it doesn't mean anything. But two and a half weeks ago, in going door to door in Hebron, Indiana, I encountered a gentleman by the name of Chris Staubaum. And he had a sign in his front yard that said, Home for Sale by Owner. And I engaged in a conversation and I said, where are you moving to? He said, in an apartment. Because he is on the crew at LTV that is preparing to close that plant. The next day, I was at a church service in Gary, Indiana. And DeMarco McGee came up to me and thanked me for my effort on behalf of steel workers in the steel industry. And I said, where do you work? He said, I don't anymore. I used to work until last Friday at USX. This morning, I was at Calumet High School in Gary, Indiana. And for the entire hour I was there, seniors and juniors in high school only wanted to talk about their mother who had lost her job their father who was going to be laid off on Friday and the devastation that that occurred and where are they going to get money to go to school? What's going to happen to their parents' health insurance? Are they going to be able to stay in their house? These are citizens. And the ITC has found at the instigation of President Bush that it is illegally traded steel that has caused this problem and we have a responsibility to act as we see the world today, and that is to do something now because more of these companies and many more thousands of these people are not going to be there in February and March when we come back. Please let us have this debate tomorrow. I will take my chances and my colleagues will take our chances on the floor, but let us at least have a debate. Uh, in the end, uh, I was side with the argument that the last time I read the Constitution, this institution and the Senate comprise a co-equal branch with the administration. And if we solve some of these pressing problems that have been debated and talked about the last two hours today, and send a strong message to the administration that the prosecution of the war is being undertaken in a good fashion, but there is more we respectfully suggest need to be done right now. I think the president, in his wisdom, would listen to our message and he would sign that bill. I think it is worth taking the chance and I would ask that you allow me to offer the amendment. Well, thank you, Mr. Viskowski. I've always found you to be one of the most articulate members of uh, this uh, house and uh, certainly appreciate uh, your very thoughtful and uh, testimony and uh, your hard work, you. uh, Mr. Frost. Ms. Koski, I am very interested in your amendment. Um, LTV uh, used to be uh, a much larger company and had uh, quite a few aerospace employees in my district in Texas. And when they filed for Chapter 11 reorganization in the mid-1980s, at that time they attempted to unilaterally uh, in the health and life insurance benefits for their retirees and uh, I was very much involved with uh, Lou Stokes and Peter Rodino in uh, changing the bankruptcy laws to make sure that a company just by the act of filing for Chapter 11 could not unilaterally terminate those benefits. Uh, it sounds like we've, they've gone quite beyond that today in terms of their own their situation. And I'm very sympathetic with uh, what you're trying to achieve and hope you'll be successful and tend to support your amendment here in the committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Price. Yeah. Judge Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and I thank the gentleman for his very uh, articulate testimony. It um, certainly does not fall on deaf ears from a, an Ohioan. We feel the same pain. Uh, LTV's got a lot of employees right in my own district, and um, Steele is Ohio, and so right. we um, appreciate uh, the value of your testimony and, and your compassion uh, with which you give it. Thank Thanks. you very much. I appreciate it. Mrs. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Wisklowski, I certainly agree with you. I agreed with you when you were here before. Um, as far back as I can recall, in my days in the state legislature, we were concerned with illegal dumping of steel in the United States. And it, it defies belief to me that 
in all these years, we've simply not done anything really about it. And we've allowed that major industry in the United States to just leave us. Um, if there's anything we can do now, I understand that what you're trying to do is just preserve health benefits for retirees. Is that correct? Ms. Slaughter, uh, not necessarily. Uh, that is one of the liabilities that the integrated portion of the industry faces, that and their pension liability. What I mean to do, and those who support the amendment mean to do, is to provide the integrated portion of the industry with relief on the liabilities. Essentially, their liability on an annualized basis is about $950 million. We would essentially help them over these next three years to allow the companies to consolidate, to reduce their capacity, and essentially save themselves so that in the future they remain viable entities, although smaller. Uh, that they continue to pay taxes, they pay into those pension funds, they continue to pay those health insurance benefits, uh, and they don't provide a further burden on society. So directly, yes, we want to deal with the health care, but the end product and the goal is to allow the domestic industry to save itself because my great concern is that we will lose U.S. control over the ability to make raw steel. Yes. Now, how many uh, companies are left? Only, what, six or eight in the whole uh, country? No, there actually are a greater number of companies like that, and I would give you a ballpark estimate that there's probably about 75. The argument is that that is way too many. Uh, we should have fewer companies, and today I would not argue with that premise. But because of the liability overhang and the inability from a cash standpoint to consolidate mm -hmm. to save themselves, uh, I think it's duplicitous for us to say, well, that's what you should do before we provide you relief under 201, but we're not going to give you the means to do it. And in the end, we are going to pay the cost for that mm -hmm. failure. Uh, I have to tell you in my heart of hearts, I don't want to lose another ton of production capacity in this country. I don't want to lose another job. Nobody's ever told me, don't come in tomorrow morning. Yeah. Sell your house because you don't have a job. But that's going to happen. You want to now limit your loss. You want to preserve at least the basic ability to melt steel. Because another argument is, well, we have electric furnaces. We can melt scrap. But to be honest with you, I don't want to live on somebody else's scrap. And I want to be able to melt raw materials that are abundant in this country so that if we have a state of emergency, we don't have to wait for somebody to ship steel slabs in. What's the cost of the federal government for your proposal? Uh, it would be $2.4 billion over three, over three years. And I think it is a small price to pay in allowing those companies to continue to exist to pay taxes, to make an investment and profit, and to have those employees continue to do the same thing. We have a and number of communities steel. in my state, yeah. and I assume the state of Ohio, right. where the state now is called upon to bail out school corporations and local entities of government because the facility may be its largest taxing mm -hmm. uh, provider in a local constituency. So you have local subdivisions of government also that are very much stressed. I did notice this one clipping you gave us from the Post Tribune, you know, that the Gary, Indiana City Council just voted $45 million for a stadium. But nonetheless, there you are. I, I need some good amendments. They use steel, you see, I in, see. The, in the situation, <laughs> while Gary Steele goes out of business. Um, uh, as you well know, uh, Mr. Viskoloski, I'm very supportive of your amendment and the implications that you raised for the defense of this nation. Um, are well taken and a reason enough, in my view, for us to make uh, your amendment in order. I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you, sir. Sure. Thank you for your courtesy. Uh, before uh, asking a distinguished group of New Yorkers to come forth as a panel, I know you've been waiting here a long time. I'd let I would recognize. I'll recognize uh, Mr. Frost at this point from wherever you would like to speak. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I am offering an amendment uh, on behalf of myself. Um, this was an amendment that was offered by Mr. Murtha in committee and was rejected in committee. Uh, this is an amendment that uh, would provide additional uh, emergency anti-terrorism appropriations uh, for the defense and the intelligence communities. Um, this would provide a total of 
$2.54 billion of increases. This would be $2.001 billion, uh, $2 billion in intelligence upgrades, $817 million in chemical and biological defense capacities, $755 million for special forces capabilities, $912 million for munitions and essential equipment replenishment, $966 million for force protection improvements, $602 million for essential aircraft upgrades, and $495 million for operational costs for the Afghan operation. Uh, this is a partial restoration of OMB cuts. Of the amounts in, in this amendment, nearly $5 billion are derived from a $45 billion list of OMB cuts to supplemental appropriation requests of the Department of Defense and intelligence agencies. In total, the Defense Department and the intelligence agencies submitted supplemental appropriations requests to OMB totaling over, four, over $66 billion for specific items they felt were needed to fight the war on terrorism, to recover from the September 11th attacks, to improve capabilities to detect and respond to chemical and biological attacks, and to better protect military personnel and critical national security assets. OMB cut this request back to $21 billion, leaving 70 percent of the defense and intelligence requests unfunded. The amendment that I will offer would finance an additional $5 billion worth of the highest priority needs that should not be deferred until next year. This would still leave over 60 percent of the agency's supplemental requests unfunded. Additionally, my amendment also fin finances roughly $1.7 billion in high priority programs not included in the administration's supplemental requests. These include $800 million for Pentagon renovation to accelerate the 12-year plan by at least four years, $250 million for fast mods to bunker buster weapons upgrades to chemical biological detectors, $185 million to establish National Guard civil support teams in, tw uh, in 28 states and territories, $40 million for the non-Lugar uh, process to dismantle Russian anthrax and smallpox production plants, $25 million to augment local emergency emergency response capabilities at Army chemical weapons storage facilities in 10 states, $50 million for quick repairs and improvements to high security biological web warfare laboratories, and $250 million for faster upgrades, deployments of U-2, UAV, and EP-3 aircraft. Now, I've detailed some of this in uh, previous questioning, witnesses that have appeared before the committee, but again, I would point out that some of these items um, are very specific and uh, include things like um, uh, Marine Corps and Army small arms ammunition um, and also uh, a specific amount of money for the Special Forces, uh, $755 million for our Special Forces who are currently operating, of course, in Afghanistan. I think this is a modest request. Uh, Mr. Murtha offered it in committee. Unfortunately, it was rejected in committee, and the full House should have the opportunity to vote on this matter, and I will ask that this be made in order under the rule that will be presented to the House tomorrow. Thank you very much, Mr. Frost. Uh, you've been very clear and, as always, uh, very eloquent. Uh, Judge Price. Thank you. I appreciate uh, my colleague's testimony. I have no questions. Uh, Mrs. Slaughter. Mr. Reynolds. Uh, Judge Hastings, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, I'd, I would ask a distinguished panel of New Yorkers, uh, Mrs. Lowy, uh, uh, Mr. Nadler, Mr. Serrano, Mr. Hinchy, uh, uh, Mrs. Maloney, Mr. Rangel, and Mr. Crowley, if uh, you would come up and uh, uh, address the committee, please. If, I don't know. Mr. Rangel, of course. Yes. I mentioned it. You're all welcome to join the panel, or if, if you'd like to, uh, so you, you would like to speak uh, separately, is that it? Or you don't mind? All right. Yes. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and we appreciate the opportunity to be for your distinguished committee, and I'm particularly pleased to be here with our colleagues from New York, Ms. Slaughter and Mr. Reynolds. And uh, we were pleased to be joined 
in this effort by the whole New York delegation. And our paths are, are one of strategy, not of commitment. We all understand that the president made a commitment to provide $20 billion for New York shortly after September 11th to recover and rebuild, and then Congress made that commitment <coughs> into law. And that's why we're here today. Mr. Sweeney and I and a number of members of the delegation are offering this amendment to the bill, asking you to allow us to debate this important amendment and to be sure that we make every effort to fulfill that promise now. I want to repeat, this was a commitment of the President of the United States of America. The package would give New York the resources it needs to rebuild and to help those directly impacted in New Jersey, Connecticut, and Virginia, as well as in New York. Mr. Chairman, it's been 11 weeks since September 11th, but the crisis has not ended. For those who've been down to ground zero more than once, for those who go home to our district, look into the face of those who've lost their loved ones, we've all attended more funerals, more wakes, more vigils than you'd want to in a lifetime. Thousands of New Yorkers are still unable to return to their homes. If you go down to ground zero, you see that the fire still burns, that the work goes on 24 hours a day. The horror of this tragedy continues, and the pain is just enormous for so many of our families. New York will never be the same, but it is our responsibility to act and make sure that our city goes on and rebuilds. We put together an amendment that would commit the billions needed to continue the enormous recovery and rebuilding effort. And what's important is that we designed it as contingency emergency spending. And it means that it would allow the president to determine when the funds are needed and declare an emergency, at which point the money would become available. I find it extraordinary that this amendment wasn't made part of the original bill. We want to express our appreciation to both Mr. Young and Mr. Obi, who were closely with us and were so supportive in the committee, as you heard today. We do believe that by making this contingency emergency money, which is not scored, and the president has the responsibility to release the money, at least we send a very strong signal that the work can go on, commitments have been made, that the money is in the bank, and that this government that made the commitment is going to keep that promise. I, I just want to make a few things clear, and I want to read a couple of sentences from my colleague, Mr. Sweeney, who couldn't be here today. Chairman Young said, and he said it over and over again in the committee, our country was attacked, he said it today, New York was attacked, we're all New Yorkers. Mr. Fleischer said, the President's press secretary, an agreement is an agreement is an agreement. In order for us to proceed, in order for New York to do what it has to do, and there's a huge job, as Mr. Young said today, he understands that this is a floor, it's not a ceiling. Having that money committed makes all the difference in the world. People are suffering. We've got to rebuild. Many of you have been down to that district. And it is incomprehensible to me that we cannot clearly commit that money now. I'm submitting Mr. Sweeney's statement for the record. Without but, objection, it's uh, But included. reading from it, I just want to read a couple of sentences. I believe the President and Speaker want to abide by their commitment to provide nearly $20 billion to New York to rebuild and recover. However, assurance is not insurance. Therefore, I respectfully submit my request to make in order an amendment that would enable the President to provide the money he promised when he deems it necessary without further legislation and consistent with the proper appropriations processes. Just to sum up, I am 100% supportive 
of the money that is being appropriated for the military in Afghanistan. I will be supportive of the money that will be appropriated to rebuild in Afghanistan. It is beyond my comprehension that this money that was committed by the President, that was promised by the President to rebuild New York, cannot be appropriated now as contingency emergency spending so New York can move forward, make the plans, help the people who have suffered so much. Again, this was a hit on the United States of America. It was a specific hit on New York City, and we have an obligation to provide that money now. Thank and I you. thank you very, thank you, Mrs. very Lowe. much. Thank you, Who will proceed? Who will proceed next? Mr. Nadler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the Rules Committee for this opportunity to testify today. I am um, pleased to be here to offer this amendment with Representatives Sweeney and Lowy to help New York recover from the horrific attacks of September 11th. I have a statement which I will submit for the record, but it's a lengthy... It's a lengthy well, statement. I'm, I'm not going uh, to read it. But let me just make a couple of points. One, the damage to New York was incredible. The city controller estimates that this attack will cost New York over $105 billion in economic activity. Over 100,000 people, 100,000 people have been laid off from their jobs as a direct result of this attack. Over 1,000 companies and small businesses have been destroyed or severely damaged. There are approximately 14,000 small businesses in Lower Manhattan. We estimate at this point that 10,000 of them may simply cease to exist. 10,000 out of the 14,000 if we do not deliver help to them rapidly. The main problem, and there are two main problems from my point of view with the bill as structured which this amendment will fix. One, it's been said a promise is a promise. And the promise here is very important because it will, people are making decisions now. The, uh, residents are making decisions whether to leave or try to, or, or, or return. Small businesses are making decisions whether to, uh, small business owners are making decisions whether to throw in the towel and close the business or try to survive. Large businesses are making decisions as to whether to take temporary lodgings elsewhere and then come back to lower Manhattan. One of the things that will determine a lot of those decisions, frankly, is whether people think there is a real commitment to help Manhattan, to help New York recover, and that they can, so much so that they can bet their businesses uh, and their livelihoods on it. If people see that a piece of legislation was passed through the, by the Congress and signed into law by the President, which it was, which said as a matter of law, that half or more, a minimum of half, of this $40 billion supplemental appropriations bill must be spent for disaster relief and recovery in the three states, primarily in New York. And then they observe the President and the Congress, through the allocation of this supplement, of, of what we're doing now, not live up to that commitment. Give only about $10 billion, plus or minus one, depending on the Walsh Amendment, um, to the recovery and 30 of the 40 billion to other things. With a promise that you'll get the rest later. People will look at it and say, many people will look at it and say, well, we can't depend on that. 20 billion by law. We will, if we don't pass this amendment, the bill we're considering now actually has to amend the supplemental budget appropriation that was passed two months ago because that guarantees 20 billion dollars. And what we're doing now, unless we pass this amendment, unless we make this amendment in order and approve it, is changing that and saying, we didn't really mean it, maybe you'll get what we promised later. But then again, promises to the contrary, maybe not. So this will be regarded by many people, regardless of what people say publicly, they'll look at it and say, well, I can't really depend on that money being available to help revive this community, this neighborhood, my business. And maybe I'd better leave or, sh or, or shut up shop. That's point one. And it, that's the practical impact of welching on the commitment, which not passing the Walsh Amendment uh, or the, the, uh, the, the, the Sweeney Lowy Amendment will really do. Because make no mistake, it is welching on a commitment. Because even if the President and members of this House in good faith think, well, well, we'll deliver the money a little later, it's not just a question of time. It's a question of in this bill. And people will say, well, they promised it, they're not delivering it, maybe we'll get it later. But then again, who can tell? They welch once, maybe they'll welch again. It's point one. Point two, 
There is no provision in the current law for an assurance of the kind of real help that is desperately needed today, not in March. Um, we need, and the Small Business Administration has done what they can, but our small businesses, when, when you have a business, a retail business, for example, or a restaurant, which suddenly for six weeks no one is allowed to visit you because armed guards say you can't go to that block because it's in the frozen zone, for six weeks you have zero business. Now you're up to 10 or 20 percent of your normal business because the population base isn't there, because people can't bring cars into the neighborhood, they can only walk 30 blocks. Maybe in six months this will be better and you'll be back to your normal business, but you've got to get over that six-month hump. And that's the real situation here. A loan, which is what the Small Business Administration gives, doesn't help, especially when you don't have collateral for that loan and you don't meet the criteria. We need grants if these small businesses are going to survive. Now, the CDBG, which under the Walsh Amendment, Community Development Block Grants, may provide, which is up to two and a half billion dollars, may provide some of those grants if it comes in time, if the governor decides to make that money available for grants as opposed to a million other things. Um, in this amendment is contained the World Trade Center Claims Act, modeled on what we did for New Mexico after their disaster uh, last year or the year before. Provides a se for a separate office within FEMA to handle claims with a minimum of red tape right away to get the money out, FEMA money, to the victims, including grants to small business people. If we pass this, then there's real hope that many, perhaps most of the small businesses will survive. If we don't, I am very dubious that most of the small businesses will survive. And it's just that plain. The bill without this amendment does not give us assurances or any reasonable likelihood really of getting the kind of help for the small businesses and many of the other victims, but especially the small businesses that will enable them to survive. And let me be very plain too. If those small businesses don't survive, if you don't have at least a critical mass of those small businesses surviving, then the residents are not going to come back and they're going to leave. The big businesses are not going to come back. And you're going to have a permanent major economic disaster in the financial center of the Western world. If we pass this, and if we are lucky and most of those small businesses survive, then you'll have what I might call a new growth forest. And there'll be a critical mass that will survive, and other small businesses and large businesses will come in and replace those that will not survive or will not return. But if we don't have that critical mass, we're looking at a long-term, perhaps permanent disaster. And I very much fear that this legislation, without this amendment, without the uh, ability to give uh, large numbers of small business grants with a minimum of red tape and quickly, which the amendment provides for, but the existing legislation, even with Mr. Walsh's amendment for CDBG, does not provide for, will not meet the need. So that's why we need to do, it's not simply a question of now versus later, although it's partially that, but it's getting this ability to give, to save our, our, our small businesses. The estimates are, as I said, we could lose 10,000 to 11,000 of the existing 14,000 small businesses in the area, and if that happens, you've got a major, major economic disaster in your hand for, for as far into the future as we can see. So I, I, I urge that this amendment, which was defeated by the narrow is conceivable margin 31-33 in the uh, Appropriations Committee be made in order so it can be considered on the House floor uh, so that our colleagues can vote on this most important uh, uh, and crucial survival issue for us. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. Nadler. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Rangel. I'd like to yield to the uh, to members from the Appropriations of course. Committee. Mr. Serrano. Well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, since I come, to, uh, thank you. Mr. Rangel, since I come to you both as a ranking member of a subcommittee on appropriations and as a New Yorker, let me then, for the record, uh, place before you a statement on behalf of the OMI, uh, OB amendment, uh, which I think is a very necessary one. And rather than read that statement, I'd just like to submit it for the record. Surely, or without objection. <clears throat> as far as the, the, uh, the, the New Yorker's amendment, uh, here are the concerns that I have and that I continue to voice. If I, I know that, uh, Mr. Chairman, we usually don't comment about a camera being in the room, but the camera today is capturing a very unique and somewhat sad situation. A group of New Yorkers imploring a committee to allow us to put an amendment on the floor 
to see what the House will do about an amendment that speaks to an appropriation that's already in law. And that in itself is a unique situation. That money has already been uh, associated with New York. It was supposed to come to New York, and now it seems like it's not going to come to New York. And as I said before, here, here's my concern. We are told in the Appropriations Committee by Chairman Young, and let me preface those comments by saying that there isn't a single one of us here who has anything badly to say about Bill Young, one of the nicest human beings and a great chairman of the committee. And I believe him when he says that he wants to help New York. But I think it's out of his hands next spring. See, we're being told, don't push now. We'll get you the money in the spring. In the spring, we will have a different world. First of all, the fervor about New York City and our tragedy at this moment may not be the same next spring. Secondly, if this economy continues to hurt and other situations arise, we've got weather conditions that are creating havoc in many places of the country, we have no understanding what this country will be going through uh, will be going through next year. We don't know what this war will t where this war will take us early next spring. So this whole idea of wait till spring and you'll get the money that was promised to you. And then the other statement which frightens members of the Appropriations Committee, which is we will move dollars around. Well, that'll never happen, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Next spring, different things will be into play. And if what we're talking about in moving dollars around is to actually go into the federal budget and take money either out of any one of our subcommittees, I'll give you mine as an example. New York is going to get money at the expense of the FBI losing money next spring. New York is going to get money out of the expense of the DEA losing money. New York will get money out of the Commerce Department, out of the Justice Department, out of the State Department, out of the INS, out of NOAA. Those are just some of the agencies that my committee has jurisdiction over. As I've said before, if that hap comes to be, New York doesn't win that battle next spring. New York loses that battle. And for that reason alone, the only time to get this money that is so needed in New York is to get it now so that we can pay the bills that we have to pay, so that we can begin to rebuild and, and put people uh, back to work and, and get the economy rolling in New York City. I just want to close with, with this comment. Uh, you know, I. I spent this last week uh, between handing out uh, flags to families of people who were lost at the World Trade Center, reminding people that this House approved a bill of mine that will allow folks who are not citizens but who had applied for citizenship to be retroactively made citizens as of September 10th, and then attending vigils and candle lighting ceremonies for the victims of Flight 587. The, that city is both in a state of sadness and somewhat depression and a desire at the same time of an upbeat desire to build itself. But the city is quickly beginning to get the feeling that a promise, more than a promise, that a law is somehow not going to be implemented for the rest of the dollars that were coming to us. And no one in New York City believes, <coughs> except for the mayor, but he's not going to be around next spring, he wants to, but he won't be around next spring. He's the only one who seems to think the money will be around next spring. And so here it is, a very sad situation. We're imploring this committee to allow us to bring to the floor an amendment and let the House do what the House wants to do with it. But it is the only way that we can get fairness and we can start to rebuild the city. With that, I close. Thank you, Mr. Serrano. Mr. Inch. Mr. Chairman, uh, let me say, first of all, that in the immediate aftermath of the attack that occurred on September 11th. The leadership of this House and the membership of this House acted in a very noble way, consistent with the traditions of the House and the history of the House when disaster strikes anywhere in the country. That is particularly true of the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Mr. Hastert, and it is particularly true of the Chairman of the Appropriations Committee, Mr. Young, and the ranking member of that committee, Mr. Obey. Very quickly, they were instrumental in negotiating legislation which stipulated that not less than half of a $40 billion appropriation would be allocated for the needed disaster relief in the city of New York, Virginia, the site of the Pentagon, and in Pennsylvania. It was very clear that the largest portion of that 
billion dollars would be assigned to the city of New York because that was where the greatest tragedy, the greatest disaster struck. And we were very pleased with that. Everyone knew that that would just be the beginning because the amount of money that would be required for the city alone would, would greatly exceed the $20 billion. But something happened in the interim. And as a result of that something, the city is now, and the state of New York, is now getting only approximately one half of what the law requires. The law requires $20 billion, but only half of that is now forthcoming. And so we are here to plead with this committee to make in order an amendment which would correct whatever it was that intervened in the arrangement that was made by the Speaker of the House and the Chairman of the Appropriations Committee so that New York City and New York State can get the financial help that it needs. There is also a deep irony here, Mr. Chairman. Never before in anyone's memory has a state delegation approached the House of Representatives through the Appropriations Committee in the wake of a disaster asking for financial relief to deal with the consequences of that disaster and then be turned down by the committee and by the House. That's never happened before. We have various kinds of disasters, earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, fires. In every instance, the House Appropriations Committee and the full House responds to the delegation seeking legitimate requests for relief and aid to deal with that disaster. The city of New York has been struck by an extraordinary disaster, the likes of which we have never seen before in the history of the country. And we are asking for the House to behave the way it always does and to provide relief for the city and state of New York. Failure to do so is going to establish a very strange unusual and very poor precedent. So I'm hoping that this committee will do what is right and that you will make in order this amendment so that the full House of Representatives can have the opportunity to consider this question. If that fails, we should all understand what the consequences of that will be. The consequences will be that the 100,000 people, or many of them, that have been put out of work that Mr. Nadler referred to a few moments ago, will not get their unemployment insurance benefits because the unemployment insurance benefits will not be extended. That's what this amendment would, would allow. The un uninsurance employment benefit program, the fund in the city of New York, is virtually bankrupt. So people who are entitled to unemployment insurance will not be receiving it. Furthermore, People have been deprived of their health insurance as a result of the loss of their job, the loss of their employment, the destruction of their place of work. Without this amendment, COBRA will not be available to those people and they and their families will not have health insurance. Those who do not have health or do, who do, did not have health insurance will not have health insurance made available to them under Medicaid, which, which this amendment would provide. Furthermore, workers' compensation will not be adequately available to those people who were injured as a result of this disaster. So what we are asking for here today is simply what the Congress always provides to states and cities that are struck by disaster, the legitimate help that is necessary to meet the costs of that disaster. And furthermore, it is already written into law. It's already in the law. So we are hopeful that this committee will allow this amendment, make it in order, so that a, f a vote can be had by the full House of Representatives. We're confident of that is allowed, that the measure will pass, and the city and state of New York will get the kind of attention that every section of this country has always gotten when disaster has struck. Thank you, Mr. Inch. Mr. Crowley. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me thank you and the members of the committee for your patience and, and listening uh, to our plea. Uh, it's difficult to add to the emotional uh, request that's being made by my colleagues uh, here from New York. I wish there was some way uh, that before the committee made a decision that uh, we could talk with the 
minority leader and the speaker to see whether or not this is the time and place that the president would want to draw the line. I say that because, uh, in my opinion, everyone knows that we're morally right. Uh, there's no question that we're legally correct. Uh, our delegation, who's uh, we, we really had very, very few uh, partisan disputes, but since 9-11, uh, we have worked together just as a team. Most of the time, we just thank the Congress for its emotional and, 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 and legislative response uh, to the fact that by no choice, uh, we were the frontline troops. We were out there. It could have happened to any town, any village, any state, and, uh, and we would have responded in the same way. Uh, we did not know how we would respond, but as New Yorkers, we were proud to see that we set a standard of courage, uh, of dedication, of protection of humankind, uh, that, that we housed the center that represented the aspirations and dreams of the world. Uh, we lost thousands of lives, firemen, policemen, and, and this Congress and the world responded, and they said, we're going to bond with you. When we met with the president in the White House, he was there uh, for us. And the pain that we suffer in New York uh, is not that we're not going to come back. It's, it's, it's who's going to be with us on the road of and, and how we can build on the commitments that were made for other people to borrow to, to, to restore the financial district and to get us back uh, to hiring some of the people who have lost their jobs. So we're talking with the Association for Better New York, the Chamber of Commerce, the Business Roundtable, the New York City Partnership. They haven't the slightest clue as to why the president picked this time and place to say, I'm going to veto. In the stimulus package of the House and Senate, we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars in tax cuts. And we're not even say spend the money now. We're saying that, hey, put that in our bank account and we'll show you what we need and let the president decide how he's going to uh, repay us for the things that we're trying to build. But what bothers me, Mr. Chairman, is that we don't know what's in the cards for this country or the world tomorrow. And we should not have to ask any of our colleagues to give up resources that have been appropriated for their needs just because someone has decided this time and place that they're going to renege on a promise. I know my mayor and my governor believe we are right. I know they need the money. The problem is simple. And it's simple within our delegation where we had every Republican with us fighting within the Appropriation Committee and without. The problem is no one wants to take on the president. He's decided through his OMB director that if we exercise our will as legislators that they say he's going to veto. Well, all presidents, Republican or Democrats, don't have to be right. And I really think that, that the speaker and the minority leader before the president he allows us to believe that he's changed his mind on the legislation that we passed and he supported, that we have to talk about it. Because as Marie Senchi was talking about the long-lasting effects, in my mind, I thought he was going to say, what are other communities going to believe how they're going to be treated? if they had a catastrophe, if a promise was made to them, would they believe that that promise is just during the time of the painful losses? What happens after the funeral when the flags are not flying every day? Can we really depend on each other when our needs become different today than they were yesterday? As a country and as a Congress, we should never have to ask that question. We should be able to depend on what has been promised today and then move on collectively so that no matter whose district it is, we never have to feel a sense of obligation to each other. We are one nation, and New York City, 
we were out there, out front, but heck, we're the closest to the Statue of Liberty. If that was our hit, if they picked us, well, we're proud to represent the United States, but we're feeling the pain of that pride, and, and I just don't believe that members of Congress and members of this committee should have to make such an awesome decision tonight without involving the speaker, without involving uh, the minority leader, and without sending notice to the president. Because what you've heard this evening and been patient enough to hear is only going to be a sliver of what you're going to hear tomorrow on the floor. And you're listening to people who are patriotic but pained, and we thank you for your patience. Thank you, thank you very much. Ms. Maloney, would you like to address the committee? Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I, I join with uh, my colleagues in requesting this, that this amendment be put, placed in order and fully debated on the floor. We are in a unique and unusual situation of asking for an amendment that has already been approved by the House and signed by the President. Of the $40 billion that's been allocated, we were promised and pledged $20 billion. But out of the $40 billion, only $11 billion is coming to New York. Now, many people say that uh, we don't have the needs, that we can wait for tomorrow or eventually. But we should have gotten that money yesterday. And if anyone thinks we don't have the needs, I invite them to go to Pier 94, where victims, families, organizations, businesses, are lined up seeking relief. Earlier today, Congressman Nadler and I uh, attended a meeting at Penn Station where many victims have lost their jobs, businesses that have gone under or are on the verge of going under came and showed us their invoices. One of the problems that we have, oh, okay. one of the problems that we have is that some of the costs don't fit into the neatly defined definition of the federal government of what is a disaster. But we went through stacks of invoices from hospitals who immediately canceled all elective surgery and opened their doors and rushed down to ground zero to help people. They have lost hundreds of millions of dollars. Our public school system down in that zone, schools were closed. Education was disrupted. In some cases, the schools were hindered and supplies destroyed and all kinds of expenses. And they have submitted invoices of hundreds of millions of dollars. Our utility companies rushed to the scene and to this day are putting in new wires, responding to it. And if this is not met by the federal government, then the cost of this new wiring will then again be passed on to the victims. So we have tremendous needs. And as we speak right now, as we speak right now, many individuals and businesses are deciding whether they're going to stay in New York or leave. And believe me, the economic strength of New York hangs in the balance. And what this Congress does or doesn't do will have a tremendous impact on these decisions that impacts on New York's economy and then really the economy, not only of New York, but of our country. We all know that New York was a symbol of America and America was attacked when New York was attacked. The people of America have been more generous than this Congress with their individual checks they have sent over a billion dollars to New York to help with the victims, to help the police and fire, to help all the areas that rushed to ground zero. And to me, I find it a national disgrace if this Congress does not live up to the pledge, to the commitment that was made to the American people and to our country and to New York. New York took it on the chin for the rest of the country. They weren't attacking New York, they were attacking America. But New York took it on the chin and we are suffering. People are suffering. And anyone who says, we don't have costs, 
We don't have needs. Just go down to ground zero. It is still burning. It is still burning and dangerous. And while ground zero burns and the World Trade Center continues to burn, we come here and see this leadership of this country wavering in its support for New York. I, I went to the Appropriations Committee and, and uh, saw the valiant uh, work of the members of uh, Serrano and Hinchy and Lowy and uh, Walsh and, and uh, Sweeney. And we had the votes. We had the votes in the committee because people were telling us they were going to be voting with us. It ended up a very close vote, 31-33. And the only reason we failed on this bipartisan event is that uh, I'm told the administration came out and just said everybody couldn't vote for it. Well, I'm saying to you, people should vote for it. And I believe, I really believe if this amendment gets to the floor, we'll win on the floor. Because I have never seen more members from across this country come and express both sides of the aisle in the best bipartisan spirit that they appreciate the suffering that is taking place in New York, the tremendous loss that happened for the country. We were attacked because we're Americans. That's why we were attacked and we're near the airports and they got to us. But it's an attack against America and we need America to stand with us and we need this Congress to be as supportive as the people of America have been. And another thing that is so upsetting about this is that the 20 billion was supposed to be a floor, not a ceiling. If we don't get this money, then you put us in the position of going around with a tin cup in another budget where my colleagues on the Appropriations Committee have pointed out it's going to be even more difficult. So every report that has come out has estimated that the loss is over $100 billion. We've lost a documented 100,000 jobs, and we will continue to unravel if the support doesn't come, which New York needs, which New York has already received, and I consider this taking it away from us. And anyone saying we can't spend the money, just go to Ground Zero, go to Pier 94, and talk, and go through the invoices that we're collecting from the various uh, businesses and people that are in pain. And so we ask respectfully that this important amendment be placed in order and fully debated on the floor and passed. I mean, I don't think that in the whole time I've been in Congress, I've ever seen a law that passed have to go to the Rules Committee to get put into a rule to go back and be passed again. Thank you. Ms. Crowley. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And firstly, let me thank uh, you and Mr. Dreyer for this opportunity, as well as Ranking Member Frost and the other members of the committee. Uh, my good friend and colleague from New York, uh, Mr. Reynolds, who has served within the state legislature for a good many years, as well as Louise Slaughter from New York as well, members of this committee. Uh, I'm not going to add much more than has been said already and has been said so eloquently by uh, the other members from the delegation. I would just um, maybe put a little different context, and that is that New York City has sustained a wound, a gaping wound. A dagger was put through its heart. And it's in surgery right now. And for two months it's been in surgery. And we have the best doctors that want to help the city. They want to do it. They have the right medicine coming to it. They're just not getting the proper dose. We're getting money. We're just not getting the amount of money that we need. And that's what it's really all about. Uh, I know that um, the mayor has said uh, that if he got much of this money, he put it in T-bills. Well, that's fine by me. We'll take the money and put it in T-bills. So that's what it means. It means getting it through January and February and March of next year before we can actually come back to even discuss uh, quite possibly a supplemental bill. I was in, I think, probably the most lofty meeting I've ever been in my life and maybe, quite frankly, the most lofty meeting I'll ever be in my life when I sat in the cabinet room of the White House uh, a couple of days after the attack on New York City, an attack upon our country. And I was there when the commitment was made for $40 billion, uh, overwhelming uh, uh, portion of half of that $40 billion, $20 billion going to uh, New York City. And now I find myself with the rest of this delegation uh, sitting before uh, the Rules Committee uh, with, in no other way of describing it as glor other than glorified begging that we at least have an opportunity to get 
um, this amendment to the floor, because I know if the amendment gets to the floor, that it will pass overwhelmingly. Not because, not because members on both sides of the aisle want to vote for this amendment, the Sweeney Lowy amendment, but because the American people want us to vote for this amendment. Uh, they know that we're suffering. They know that New York is bleeding. We're bleeding jobs. We're bleeding money. And, and we're suffering right now. And that's what we're asking this committee to do, uh, to, to recognize the commitment that was made to New York uh, and recognize that the commitment was for now, not down the road. When I was in that room, it was never said to us that you'll get this, you'll get this money you know, down the road, $20 billion. I understood it that we get the money immediately as soon as it was assigned into law and, and it'll be get it allocated immediately. That's what we're talking about. That's the commitment I want to see lived up to uh, today. And that's why we're asking you uh, to protect uh, the uh, Sweeney Lowy amendment and let it go to the floor and let it have its proper vote on the floor of the House of Representatives. I know it'll pass. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. You've all been most eloquent and obviously effective in, in uh, bringing forth uh, uh, the merits of the uh, Sweeney Lowy Amendment, Mr. Frost. <clears throat> well, as I mentioned earlier today, um, my wife and I have made uh, two trips to New York, spent two weekends in New York uh, since September 11th, and we have been struck both by the spirit of the people and by the devastation. And uh, we went down into Ground Zero. And my colleague Charlie Rangel, we, we, we took a, a, a a bus ride around the city last weekend and I couldn't help but see all over the city every fire station we passed including the fire station in Harlem there were memorials to people who died uh, on that day uh, and Harlem is a long way from that part from the World Trade Center and a commitment was made to New York and this Congress needs to honor that commitment uh, for the good of the, not just for the good of New York, but for the good of the country. And uh, if this Rules Committee tonight does not make your amendment in order, uh, we will, Democrats on the floor tomorrow, will fight that rule. And I have supported, I've been in Congress for 23 years, and I have supported every defense appropriation rule in those 23 years. And I will vote against this rule tomorrow if your amendment is not made in order. And I hope this House will reject this rule if your amendment is not made in order. Mr. Frost, what I meant when I said we should talk with the Speaker. What I meant when I said about the consequences and we should talk with the Speaker, Mr. Chairman, is that I don't want to see the Republicans my state delegation to have to vote for something that they don't believe in. I don't want to see the Republicans that truly know that what we are saying is the right thing to do for them to have to take a party vote against us. We have really worked together as a bipartisan Congress, and it is something that's been good for the country, it's been good for the president, and it's been good for us as a body. I am telling you, no matter how OMB describes this, it's not going to fly to the people in the United States of America. And so your decision this evening is not just another question of what the Rules Committee would do. It's a question of what the House leadership decides it's going to do. And, and I will do all I can to get Speaker, to get Minority Leader Gephardt to meet with the Speaker, to talk with the White House. There'll be enough things for us to fight on in a partisan way. But the flags are waving, the funerals are still going on, the bodies are still being searched for. I don't think this is the time to say that we're going to hold back on the commitment we made. Mr. Hastings. Uh, Ms. Slaughter. Just that I'm, I'm with you, and uh, I'm softly proud of my district where over $4 million was raised, and lots of food and emergency workers went down, and uh, we consider the state of New York was attacked when New York City was attacked, and, uh, and we'll stand right there with you. Thank you, Mr. 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 Nadler. 
Yes, I just want to make a, a very brief comment. Thank you. Uh, Marty, uh, Mr. Frost uh, talked about how all over New York City he saw memorials around firehouses. The New York City Fire Department, on average, firefighting is a very dangerous business, brings out a lot of courage in people, loses five or six men a year. On one day, the New York City Fire Department lost 343 firefighters. That's better than 60 years worth <coughs> in, of normal rate of, of loss of firefighters uh, lost in one day. The carnage, the, the, um, the damage was incredible. I just wanted to comment on uh, what Mr. Frost said. And I also want to just add that uh, I certainly hope that, as, as, as Charlie said, that uh, this will not be, this this rules consideration will not be handled in a sort of usual way. The the leadership wants it. They don't want the bill changed. Therefore, don't move out the amendment. Don't make the amendment in order. This amendment is, is of such great importance to New York and to the country that I really think it behooves this committee to let the House work its will. And I hope you'll consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As my colleagues on the Rules Committee can see, this is a very emotional issue. Uh, it's one that the country certainly has dealt with on emotion and the spirit of Americana across our country as we entered war. Uh, but to each of my colleagues who are at this table, they lost uh, some instances loved ones, constituents, friends, as this touched the personal conflict of people uh, from New York. And it also is most instances, with the exception of Mr. Hinchy and I, their home, New York City, the five boroughs that make up the great city of New York. And that's a very emotional situation to look at each day with tough questions being asked and important answers need to be given. And I accept the fact that my colleagues want $20 billion under the mattress or wherever else they can see it. And where I come from in the New York State Legislature, unlike some of my colleagues from the states they hail, trust isn't a frontline word in how legislators and governors deal in New York. They're by memo of understanding. They're written in statute. It's let us see it under the law so we know exactly what's ours. That's been a way of doing business for at least two decades in the great empire state of New York. That doesn't necessarily make it right or wrong. It's an environment New Yorkers are used to that maybe 48, 49 other states don't quite see that legislative process. And uh, sometimes things are sold once and twice and three times uh, between legislative bodies and governors to get the job done. My colleagues have expressed the fear of that unknown. And they've expressed it in a way of saying, let us escrow the money. In my terms, as a realtor and an insurance broker with an escrow account, let us set it aside so we see it. And Jim Walsh, John Sweeney, Nita Lowy, and Mo Hinchy and Jose Serrano did an awesome job at bringing that case before the Appropriations Committee. And we lost that. And first instinct is always, let's look at the next piece coming along comes in two fronts. One, the Rules Committee, and the rule itself. We bring it down. A lot of people are going to have to make a tough decision by tomorrow. Mr. Frost has spoken his mind. And that is that we're at war. We authorize the President's use of force in war. And we are building our defense and homeland security. And we're sending money to New York, and we're dealing with America's problems as a whole. But as I said earlier with my colleague, Mr. Walsh, who negotiated a very difficult piece to begin to continue bringing immediate money, in the emotion, there is no exact solution. I guess the exact solution, if the $20 billion was set aside, uh, everybody would feel better watching it, and the politics of this would go away. But in the reality of looking at a number of things, it is still the executive branch at all levels that move the money once it's appropriated or budgeted at whatever level. And when you look at the OMB director with anger that you want your money, as Mr. Walsh and I did in those negotiating rooms, and he says, are you aware that of the seven billion set aside, 600 million has been drawn down on FEMA? 
And Mr. Walsh educated me as an expert who oversees FEMA as a VA HUD cardinal that 75% of our bill, which will exceed $20 billion in my mind, will be FEMA. And he has a letter from the director saying that the early estimates are 12 to $18 billion, right off the top as they look at the examination of that. And Jim Walsh early was able to secure $700 million of community development block grant money that has the greatest of flexibility to help rebuild lower Manhattan in those 15 blocks. Uh, he was able to ante that up to $2.525 billion. That is not going to be easily spent, even with its great flexibility for infrastructure or for small businesses or for business as a whole. And it's there. It will be underway if this thing passes, as will the Workers' Comp Trust Fund and job training and the dollars moving. And I've looked over the $20 billion immediate needs package that Senator Schumer and Senator Clinton put forward as Congress quickly passed a $20 billion operation, an agency and other cleanup costs and transportation infrastructure, and the $7 billion set aside of the 14 that was estimated needed in what most have acknowledged will be years to complete its work. Utilities reconstruction is eligible under the Community Development Block Grant money that Congressman Walsh was able to negotiate in this at $900.9 billion, $900 million of, of estimated cost. The economic st stabilization for businesses and displaced workers. Yes, we've got some additional things we need out of the federal government. I respect the ranking member and the dean of the New York delegation when he says there won't be a stimulus package. I don't know. I hear his opinion. I've seen uh, over time uh, bills come together quickly, bills fall together and fall apart quickly. Maybe there will be, maybe there won't be an economic stimulus package of which uh, there's vital things for New York in the continuation of this program. Whether it be Amo Houghton's uh, uh, tax incentive uh, uh, area, or outright dollars in COBRA and UI. But Mr. Walsh was also able to extract a commitment from OMB that if a stimulus package doesn't move forward, that a specific proposal for the UI and for COBRA, uh, they would uh, uh, work to develop uh, uh, together. There's no easy answer for the money that New York needs, which I believe will exceed 20 billion. But the same day that Walsh and Reynolds were face to face with the budget director. It was constantly brought to our attention as we fought for more money. And so far the money we've asked for, and this is a quote from Rudy Giuliani on November 17th Newsday uh, article. Quote, so far the money we've asked for, we've gotten just as quickly as we've asked for it. And the reality is that we've gotten more help than we've even asked for. The cooperation on the part of the Bush administration and the federal government has been absolutely 100 percent. Right now we don't need $10 billion. We would put it in T-bills if we got it. As we need money, we get it. We also had uh, the aspect from the governor. And that's become a political football as the governor runs for election next year. And we look at the, still the final piece of this is as we look at FEMA, if it's accepted as Mr. Walsh, as a reasonable expert, has put forward that 75% of our New York reimbursement will be under FEMA dollars. Of the $7 billion set aside, we're at $600 million, as outlined in, again, a letter that Mr. Walsh requested from the FEMA director, as he also estimated. And that doesn't include, as the master has now been appointed on the Victims Compensation Fund, the estimate of billions of dollars that will come forward to New York. And so as we close, I accept my colleagues' opinions of solutions. An easiest solution in the early days was, let's escrow the money. The reality is that this president, like previous presidents, has made clear his position on a veto of exceeding the $20 billion supplemental. As Jim Walsh said in the testimony earlier today, playing chicken with the president in the time of war and buildup of homeland security is a tough call. And so while we have all the solutions, one of which uh, is the amendment before us, we also have to look at, some are saying that we are also setting aside 
this money under a mattress until we can get to spending it so we can see it. And in my instance, you have to begin to also look at part of the trust that sometimes is lacking in New York state politics. And that is that the president repeatedly, the vice president repeatedly, and most recently the Homeland Security Director, Mr. Ridge, as he was in standing at Ground Zero, indicated that that $20 billion would be there and more if New York needed it. And so as we look at this, under the emotion and the strain that this comes, there is no easy answer as we continue getting the DOD budget out before the members of the House for their uh, consideration. Mr. Chairman, I just have one comment to my dear friend and colleague. You're right. I never said that we were not going to have a stimulus package. It is my hope. I think the nation needs it, and I do hope the House and the Senate can come together. So I just Jump. said that it, it, it involved hundreds of billions of dollars of tax cuts. But I, I never said we were not going to have one. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to comment, if I may, on one thing that uh, Mr. Nadler, our colleague uh, from New York, said. Uh, Mr. Reynolds quoted the mayor as saying we couldn't spend the money now. And the mayor did indeed say something to that effect, much to the shock of many of us in New York. And I can only attribute that ill-informed statement uh, to the fact that the mayor has not met with the hundreds of small business people who have gotten no help from the city or the state or the federal government. Um, he has not met, or anyone who could make such a statement has not met with the people who have gone to the SBA and been told that even though your uh, business is shut since September 11th, you're not eligible for a loan because you don't meet the criteria or because you don't have a house to put up as collateral, your personal house. Um, I have, I, re I represent that district. I have met with hundreds of people in desperate straits who need the money in this amendment, who need the freedom of disbursement in the World Trade Claims uh, Act part of the amendment. Um, it may be that certain kinds of FEMA uh, monies have yet been to be drawn down. But the needs of many different segments of, 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 of the society uh, in, 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 in the disaster area have not been met, are not being met, and I suspect that, that without this amendment will not be met. Thank uh, you. Judge Mr. Chairman, would the gentleman yield for a point? No, you're recognized, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, do you um, believe that community development block grant money as uh, envisioned by Mr. Walsh and set forth in the legislation first in the original legislation which was 700 million and then added upon in the negotiations will provide the type of necessary assistance for flexibility of grants or loans or any other type of assistance to small business as he envisioned it and was concurred by the budget director and second, that that money also would be eligible for use of infrastructure improvements and repair on site, whether it be for utilities or any other conditions of the buildings? Well, I, yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I am very appreciative of Mr. Walsh's initiative and of the committee's, uh, I hope, uh, of the committee's anticipated action in, in approving that increase in CDBG funds from from uh, 700 million uh, to two and a half billion dollars. And I am hopeful that some of that money may be useful for this purpose. I am not confident of that, however, because for several reasons. One, that CBG, CBDG money is eligible for use in a variety of ways, as you just stated, uh, for in, for, for, in a lot of different ways. They, they have removed, or they will remove if the Walsh Amendment passes, uh, a lot of the uh, restrictions, and that's good. It makes it flexible, but it also means that we don't know how much of that will be available for small business uh, grants. It has to go through the state government, which will put an additional layer of red tape on it, and we don't know how fast that will be available. So in some, we don't know how fast it will be available. We don't know the conditions under which it will be available. We don't know how much of it will be available for small businesses, whereas with the provisions in the uh, Sweeney, uh, Lowy, et cetera amendment, we do know that victims, in particular uh, uh, small business people, will be able, uh, will have one-stop shopping, uh, as was done for New Mexico, uh, 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 
an office within FEMA whose sole purpose is to, is, is to, is to give out money to claimants who can show the, the injury and the need for it. That money will flow quickly. It flows with virtually no uh, restrictions, um, and, it, and, it, and the bulk of it will be available, we, we expect, or as much as necessary, we should say, would be available for, um, 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 for small business grants. So the answer, in, in summary, is CBDG may very well be a, a real help in this. How much of a real help and whether a, a sufficient help, uh, we just don't know. Uh, Mr. Henry. Mr. I just want to uh, make one additional point uh, with regard to the human impact. Whenever uh, disaster strikes, whether it's an earthquake in California or a hurricane in Florida or wherever it may be, among the things that are done is to take account of the human suffering, the human misery, and the human need. That has not been done in New York. When the mayor says that they're having their bills paid, what he's talking about is the bills dealing with structural things, removing, removal of debris and things of that nature. He's not talking about the human need. Perhaps 100,000 people have lost their jobs. Families have been deprived of their breadwinners. We have not made any means of dealing with that situation. This amendment will. That's why we need this amendment. We need this amendment to take care of the deficiencies in the present context. The deficiencies in the present context are that the human needs are not being met. Unemployment, health insurance. The Walsh Amendment, as a matter of fact, takes money from the only place where you could provide health insurance for people under COBRA. This amendment will take care of the health insurance needs of the people in the city, under COBRA and under Medicaid. We could have a health crisis in New York City unless the health care needs of the people are met. And the health care needs of the people are not meet, being met presently, but this amendment would provide for that need. That's why we need this amendment. Thank you. Ms. Lowy. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to just conclude. My colleagues have all spoke very eloquently. I'd like to conclude by saying this began as a bipartisan effort. We were all united and working together to ensure that New York got the dollars that were committed by the President of the United States of America. We appreciate the efforts of Jimmy Walsh and Tom Reynolds and all those who were negotiating an interim position. But I think they all understand that this is an interim position. What we are saying, if you look at the report of the New York City Partnership that estimates the impact on New York and the dollars that are needed to rebuild and make it whole again, it was $84 billion. That was just released in detail about a week ago. If you talk to the people who are suffering, if you talk to the people who are out of work, if you go down to ground zero, you realize that promises, promises are fine. But I've been a member of the Appropriations Committee for quite a few years, and I know, as Marie said and others have said, that there are tremendous crises that you can't even imagine that may come up next month, next year. This promise was made to New York. New York has to make plans. The people are suffering. Thanksgiving has just passed. Christmas and the holidays are coming. People are without work. People who have lost their loved ones. The United States of America makes a commitment. People believe that that commitment will be kept. Everyone agrees, whether it's the chairman of the committee, Mr. Young, who's been so gracious in working with us, or Mr. Obi, the ranking member, everyone understands that this is needed. And we all agreed, working with our chairs, to call this contingency emergency money. But in order to plan, in order to look ahead, the businesses, the people, the community, those who have to make decisions for the future, do they rebuild in that? area downtown in, in Congressman Nadler's district? Do they move someplace else? People have to make plans. And unless you have that commitment in the bank, unless it's assured now, a promise for six months from now, a year from now, is not going to resolve the tremendous, tremendous challenge of rebuilding and making New York whole again. So we'd be most appreciative, and I ask again on behalf of my colleagues, that we be allowed 
to have this amendment on the floor. That's the democratic way to have the debate and let the House do its will. And I thank you very much for your indulgence. Thank you, evening. Judge Hastings. Oh, Mr. Hastings. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, pretty obviously, um, the members of the New York delegation um, that have spoken and those that are not here have spoken eloquently regarding the needs of New York. I do not mean to make my good friend from New York my shill this evening, but Mr. Reynolds, you commented um, that if New York needed the money, it would be there. Well, my response is New York needs the money. So let's put it there. Um, you also said in your remarks that there were no easy answers, and obviously they are not. But we had an easy answer earlier. We voted for the $20 billion. And this discussion here this evening and what has happened in the intervening period gives new meaning to something strange happened on the way to the forum. I really am a bit put out that we are not being more responsive to a commitment of, of, of that we made. Now, let's be, let's, let's be clear about some things. Maurice, my dear and good friend, mentioned earthquakes and hurricanes in Florida. It may come as a surprise to some of you, but not to me, that some victims of Hurricane Andrew still have not heard from this federal government. And I'm not suggesting by that at all that New York should not hear from us right now, again, since we have already done that. We dilly-dally here in this institution when it comes to flood relief. We did it on earthquakes. We did it on droughts. All of those things are not fair uh, to the people that are in need, suggesting that we need some new thought in this Congress. I've suggested to several members that we should follow the Japanese diet uh, plan for disaster. And what happens in uh, uh, their parliament in uh, Japan is they have a committee that's made up of 13 jurisdictional committees just as our own and one appointed uh, uh, by their leader to come to 14 members who handle disasters in their country totally unrelated to all of this mishmash that we are going through here about money that we committed in the first place. We should have such a committee in this Congress that should deal with imminent disasters uh, that take place and those are likely to take place even surrounding this. Coming back to, though, the main point, it has been made over and over again that we made a commitment. And I'm beginning to question whether or not the resources are there. In Florida, when I was a child, they had a card game called the skin game. And when men got off work, they would go to the skin game after they picked oranges. And what would happen sometimes in the skin game when somebody got broke is he would say, put down. And he'd tell five or six people to make their bets. And he didn't have a nickel in his pocket. And we call it walking the bet. Somewhere along the line, we must be walking something here. Either that I'm having a serious misunderstanding about what it means to have 100,000 people unemployed, what it has, means to have people in lines at Pier 94 waiting, trying to get um, uh, resources. With my own eyes and yours more than mine, I've seen the businesses that are closed in that area and the businesses that are fleeing New York and New Jersey even raising its sign after saying that it wouldn't, saying, come over here, we'll make things um, uh, uh, pleasant for you. I mean, enough already. Let's get a vote in this committee, on this rules committee, against making this amendment in order, in my view, is a vote against New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anybody else, if you had your go? Thank you. I apologize for coming in late. It uh, seems to be part of the circus these days uh, when you try and fly somewhere. And I think I understand the message. But I gather everybody's had their chance. I want to thank the board very much. I, I have a feeling I see a distinct uh, power block in front of me. And I'm uh, <laughs> sorry I wasn't here to see it all at its full strength, but uh, I got the message. I, I think uh, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. I'll be strong. Thank you, Mr. Angle. Mr. Chairman, 
Uh, yes, sir. If, if I could, at this point, I would like to submit the statement of Mr. Waxman for the record. Uh, without objection, the statement of Mr. Waxman shall be included in the record, as will be the statement of Mr. Lobiondo. Uh, if there's no objection, without objection, also the statement of Mr. Lobiondo. Uh, Ms. Gilman? Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, and I want to welcome the opportunity of appearing before the committee, and I will not keep my colleagues long. This amendment that I'm offering is based on a bill I introduced last month, Mr. Chairman, uh, entitled the Afghan Freedom Act of 2001, H.R. 3088. And I was pleased to be joined in offering that by the ranking Democratic member of the subcommittee that I chair on the Middle East and South Asia, Mr. Ackerman, New York State. Since introducing the measure on, in early October, we received the support of 81 co-sponsors on both sides of the aisle, including Mr. Diaz-Ballard, Mr. Frost, and Mr. Reynolds of this committee. We've also worked with the Bush administration over the past month, particularly with the Department of Defense, to refine some of the language in order to maximize the usefulness to the administration in the current war on terrorism. This is a measure that's supported by the Department of Defense. It's a measure in, uh, that's intended to help the administration and our armed forces in pursuing their objectives in Afghanistan. And, I'm ensure, and I've been assured that as currently written, the amendment enjoys the strong support of the administration. Essentially, the amendment provides three things. First, it reaffirms that it should be the policy of our nation to promote the removal from power of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan so as to diminish the risk of any future terrorist attack on our nation. And that's to overcome some of the naysayers who are out there that say the Bush administration has exceeded its authority. Secondly, it gives the administration an important drawdown authority. And this is where the uh, uh, Defense Department is so much interested in this measure, to provide military assistance to anti-Taliban resistance organizations in Afghanistan, as well as to any foreign countries and international organizations which are assisting in U.S. military actions that Congress authorized in the wake of the September 11th attack on our nation. And third, it requires periodic reports to the Congress regarding any violations of the United Nations sanctions on arms sales and the provisions of other assistance to the Taliban. I urge my colleagues to bear in mind that this amendment is intended to support the administration and what they're doing in Afghanistan to provide assistance to our Defense Department to make certain that there will be drawdown authority for those who are opposing the Taliban. And we speak, as we speak, our nation is fully engaged in the war, as we all know, in Taliban. The Defense Department has assured me that the enactment of my amendment will significantly enhance the ability of our nation to win both the war and a subsequent peace in Afghanistan. Accordingly, Mr. Chairman, I urge the Rules Committee to make it possible for us to provide an important additional tool to the President to assist our armed forces in what they are seeking to do. And I thank well, you. I thank Chairman Gillard very much. Uh, you always have uh, good contributions to make, and we all know that and have had in your position of leadership and eminence in uh, foreign policy for quite a while for this institution. And uh, I apologize, I wasn't here earlier today when you called me about this. Uh, obviously, we all share these objectives. I'm not sure what all the mechanics are of stitching this particular piece of legislation together, but I think I'm going to find out before the night's over. I appreciate that, I appreciate Mr. the Chairman. contribution you I know made. the uh, Defense Department may have called you as well. Uh, I, I seem to have quite a list of things. Right. <laughs> Mr. Frost. No question. Thank you. Gentleman from New York. I just want to thank my colleague from New York for coming up tonight and presenting this important testimony on uh, his request uh, that we consider this in the Rules Committee tonight. 
Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. My colleague from Florida. I, I have no questions. I'd like to be added as a co-sponsor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hastings. A, a former member of our committee, and we're sorry we lost him. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Gilbert. It's a pleasure to see you, as always. Mr. Edwards, the honorable gentleman from Texas who is on the committee, and I apologize for going out of order. I thought we were still part of the New York aura with Mr. Gilman, so that is my mistake, and I apologize for that no, uh, indiscretion. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman and, and members. Mr. Chairman, I think the lesson of September 11th and listening to the testimony tonight is that whenever humanly possible, it is far better for our nation to prevent the type of tragedy we saw on September 11th than to deal with the terrible human and economic consequences after the fact. And that is exactly why I come before this committee tonight to ask you to allow a vote on the OB amendment tomorrow on the floor. Now, most Americans may not pay much attention to the impact of the OB amendment. What's in it? How does that affect their lives? What I would like to say is that unless the OB amendment is approved on the floor tomorrow in this bill, this Congress this year, despite the devastation of September 11th, will have actually reduced funding to protect 281 million Americans from the real threat of nuclear terrorism. I think most Americans, in fact, many members of this Congress would be absolutely shocked and appalled to find out that we could finish this session this year, despite all the discussion of the threats to our country and the discussion of the tragedy of New York, and actually will have reduced funding for those very programs designed to keep Russian nuclear materials from getting into the hands of terrorists who, God forbid, could then use those against American citizens. Let me put this in perspective, Mr. Chairman. Had the terrorists of September 11th had enough enriched uranium to fill two of these cups, built it into a nuclear bomb, put it in a car, and parked it in lower Manhattan, two million people would have been killed on that tragic day. 500 times more the number than that were actually killed in that historic and terrible tragedy. I can't explain why Congress would actually reduce funding for the programs to protect Americans in the future from nuclear terrorism. But I can say for a fact that exactly will be what we have done if we do not allow a vote and actually pass the OB amendment tomorrow. I would ask you, Mr. Chairman, and every member of this committee on a bipartisan basis to ask yourself this question. When it comes to protecting 281 million Americans from the threat of nuclear terrorism, is it better that we act now or that we act next year? Let me suggest to you why I think it would be irresponsible and dangerous to procrastinate and act next year. The President of the United States, Mr. Bush, in his press conference on November 13th with Mr. Putin said this, I quote, our highest priority is to keep terrorists from acquiring weapons of mass destruction. We agree that it is urgent, urgent, that we improve the physical protection and accounting of nuclear materials and prevent illicit nuclear trafficking. President Bush called it our highest priority. He used the word urgent. Just how urgent is it? The U.S. Department of Energy says that tonight there are 600 metric tons of highly enriched uranium in Russia that could be built into 41,000 nuclear weapons that is an urgent need of better safeguards. How serious is the threat of nuclear terrorism? Let me go to a statement made to Eastern European leaders on November 6th, just 21 days ago, by President Bush. They, referring to Al-Qaeda, are seeking chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons. Given the means, our enemies would be a threat to every nation and eventually to civilization itself. We will not wait for more innocent deaths. We will not wait for the authors of mass murder to gain the weapons of mass destruction. We act now because we must lift this dark threat from our age and save generations to come. The President said we act now. He said we will not wait for more innocent deaths. I agree with President Bush. I believe we should support exactly what the Commander-in-Chief has said. Yet if we, if this committee does not allow a vote on the OB Amendment, 
It will have committed this Congress to actually reducing the very programs that are essential to keep nuclear material out of the hands of terrorists. Now, lest anyone think this is a hypothetical threat, in addition to Mr. Bush's comments that he knows al-Qaeda has been trying to seek nuclear weapons, as Mr. Obi said much earlier before you arrived, Mr. Chairman, there are 14 proven instances since 1992 where highly enriched uranium from Russia has been stolen from Russian authorities. In eight of those cases, the material was not seized until after it had escaped Russia. In three cases, it had made its way to Germany, Bulgaria, and another case, the Czech Republic, and the other cases. Uh, this is a situation, in the President's words, where we should act now. I urge the Chairman, on a bipartisan basis, without any consideration of politics from either side of the aisle, to let this House vote its will tomorrow. Let this House carry out what I believe is the single most important responsibility we have in this room and in this Congress, and that is to protect the lives of American citizens. Uh, we can make a difference for future generations, and I hope that this committee will choose to do so tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Edwards. That's uh, very uh, well articulated. Uh, I obviously uh, share your uh, your goals and objectives, and it's something that uh, our committee, uh, other committee, works on as well. And Mr. Hastings uh, sits on with me, and this is uh, something that we want to make sure we have completely under control to the greatest degree possible. So your, your thank you, Mr. Comments Chairman. are well timed, Mr. Frost. No, I just I agree with the gentleman completely. Uh, I think the uh, Republican leadership makes an enormous mistake by trying to uh, preclude all these amendments from being offered tomorrow and runs the real risk of losing this uh, rule on the floor. And I say that not because I take any uh, satisfaction or, or joy out of seeing the Republicans lose a rule on the floor. In fact, on this bill, I would like the rule to pass because I support a strong national defense. And I would like to have the uh, House I'd like for the House to have the opportunity to vote on the Obie Amendment, to vote on the uh, New York Amendment, uh, to consider the defense amendment that I'm offering on behalf of Mr. Murtha. Uh, let the House exercise its will. And if those amendments are defeated on the floor, so be it. But at least it let the House speak and address those issues. And if the Republican leadership does not permit the House to address those issues tomorrow, there is a very real chance this rule will be defeated. Mr. Chairman, if I could respond very briefly to your comments, Mr. Frost, Mr. Mr. Hastings' comments. Uh, the frustration I have felt as a member of the Energy and Water Appropriations Committee that funds the Department of Energy's non-Luger programs in Russia is that I've yet to find a single member of this House from either party say that we are not spending enough, or I've yet to find a single member who said we're spending too much. I've yet to find a single member who said we shouldn't spend more and shouldn't spend it now for these programs. The frustration is the process is resulting in an actual reduction of spending. And, uh, and as you know, through your other uh, leadership position on the Intelligence Committee, uh, all the good tensions in the world won't protect 281 million Americans from the real threat of nuclear terrorism. And with one last thought, if I could, on September 26th, the administration negotiated a new agreement with Russia. It will open up sites, Ministry of Atomic Energy uh, situ uh, sites in, in Russia that have never heretofore been allowed to be visited by American officials. We have a window of opportunity to move in and try to get control of some of those 600 metric tons of highly enriched uranium that our Department of Energy says is an urgent need of better safeguards. We have an opportunity, and perhaps a one-month window of opportunity. I hope it, it will be a 10-year window of opportunity. But I couldn't sleep with myself if we didn't make every effort right now to take advantage of that window of opportunity. And someday, 20 years from now, God forbid, I woke up turn on the television and found out that two million American citizens, men, women, and children, had been murdered in New York or Los Angeles or Chicago because a terrorist was able to get his hands on nuclear materials that perhaps, just perhaps, uh, we could do something about this year. Uh, 
I welcome your leadership from both this committee, Mr. Chairman, as well as on the Intelligence Committee, help find a solution to, to this important challenge. And, and Mr. Chairman, I would urge the Republican leadership not to fear the will of the House. Let the House exercise its will tomorrow. I appreciate the comments. Uh, Mr. Hastings, did you have a comment? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, very supportive of uh, Mr. Uh, Edwards' is very uh, articulately and eloquently uh, uh, put uh, support of uh, the OB Amendment. I would like to add um, uh, that in that um, uh, minority proposed addition to the committee bill is a provision that allows uh, for uh, funds uh, for security of Russian nuclear and biological scientists, as well as uh, the nuclear non-proliferation assistance for Russia uh, that the Chairman of the Intelligence Committee uh, works so actively on, and I have uh, the good fortune of working with him in that regard. So it's, it's more um, uh, than a notion of something that we should do. And I would just hope in keeping weapons of mass destruction away from terrorists uh, that we would contemplate uh, the OB amendment and allow, um, as everybody has said, that the House be able to work its will. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, would only add that I, uh, I feel very strongly that uh, how we go about this business uh, is very critically important. And I think there is some difference of agreement there. And I think that's probably where some of the leadership hesitation has come with the OB amendment. Uh, I don't think there's any question about the goal. I think the administration's position is that we can spend smarter and that it isn't a question of money. It's a question of how the money is applied and what capabilities we have to apply against the threat. And I think that's going to be a subject of a debate that's going to go on for some time. So whether this actually makes it tomorrow or the day after or uh, further down the week or next week in the intelligence bill, the issue is not going away. And I appreciate you bringing it to our yeah, attention tonight. And Mr. Chairman, I agree the issue is not going away. And, and you make a, a reasonable point that there can be a de an honest debate about how to spend the money. But as a member of the Energy and Water Appropriations Subcommittee who tried to add $131 million to non Luger funding, in our energy and water bill, I can tell you that I met with the Department of Energy. They listed for me specifically how they would spend immediately $131 million and said they these are dollars that could be spent very effectively, very efficiently, specifically in the materials protection control and accounting program, which even critics of other parts of our non-Luger programs agree is an effective, efficient way of going in and just, for example, building fences around Russian nuclear sites where there are holes in those fences, hiring guards where there are no guards. Uh, and obviously the chairman is well aware of all these uh, situations. And I, I appreciate your uh, patience and, and listening and, and your leadership on this issue. I just hope we can see some action taken by this Congress uh, as well as good intentions. Well, I uh, appreciate your efforts in, in this direction because I think that the more of us who are pushing in this direction, the better chance we have getting it done and, and, and properly and soon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Hastings. Uh, uh, the Honorable Bob Filner of California, who I see, who is here? Bob, well, welcome. Your comments will be uh, received without objection for the record, and we welcome uh, anything further you wish to say. It's better if you use the mic. I thank the Chairman. And uh, I have... Uh, two amendments uh, before the committee, which I would like to see made in order. Uh, I was listening with great attention to the New York delegation. Uh, clearly, the disaster of September 11th is clear. The ripple effect of that disaster has affected this whole nation. And I'm here today in my First Amendment on behalf of the southern border. What has occurred as a result of the increased security that has been demanded by this nation, appropriately so, the border security uh, called a level one security, has led to increased time spent on each person, vehicle, trying to cross the border. More questions asked, more trunks opened, more investigation done. The waits at the border, I represent San Diego, California, the biggest border crossing between two nations in the world, but I'm speaking on behalf of Calexico, California, and Nogales, Arizona, and uh, Brownsville, Texas, and El Paso, Texas, the same thing. The waits because of this increased security, have gone up from an hour to two hours to four hours, sometimes eight hours. 
What that has done is discourage the legal crossers of the border who contribute so much to our economy. The border communities are dying. They are suffering uh, decreases in business anywhere from 50 to 90 percent. Uh, hundreds of businesses may go out of business by Christmas if help is not forthcoming. The kind of help that is needed, Mr. Chairman, is not, ju is, uh, not just uh, SBA, which is in there helping, but to get more resources at the border. I have talked with the INS and the customs people in San Diego and, and across the border. We could, open, we could have the increased security we need and the flow that is uh, necessary for commerce. We can have them both with more resources. We can open every lane, every gate for 24 hours with approximately $20 million of additional positions. Given the kind of demands that ha are, are made to this committee and this Congress by New York and others, the $20 million for several hundred extra positions at the, at the, uh, the border crossings from Brownsville to San Diego would save these economies. Uh, I think it's a reasonable request, Mr. Chairman, to just allocate $20 million. I, uh, I noticed in the bill $165 million is going to the northern border, appropriately so. But it's the southern border where the economies are in real trouble. And as I calculate, $20 million will do the job. And I would hope that this uh, committee would accept an amendment which would reallocate that money for the border, uh, for the southern border. Just as those communities have become the victims of the September 11th attacks, so have federal employees who are members of our country's guard and reserve units who have been called up since September 11th. Now, as you know, Mr. Chairman, many city governments, many large corporations have decided to make up the difference between the pay that uh, th these men and women who are coming to our defense have voluntarily made up the difference. I have had incredible letters, as I'm sure others in this room have had, from uh, families who now face the loss of their homes, they can't pay their mortgages, the loss of uh, being able to send their kids to college because of the, the uh, instant reduction in their, in their take-home pay. My amendment would change that. It would make up the difference between the regular federal pay and the reserve and guard pay. If their active duty lasts for a lengthy time that would normally preclude the, their, their continuation in the federal health plan, for example, my amendment would allow those Guard and Reserve members to continue paying their portion of federal health care rather than moving their families to the TRICARE military family health care system. I think this is the least we can do for Guard and Reservists who have unselfishly committed themselves to serving our country at a literally a moment's notice. Their service makes the military functions smoothly, and the federal government should do for our reservists and guard members what other employers across the country are doing that is continuing their regular pay. So I ask uh, for a waiver on the necessary amendment for our federal employees who are serving in the guard and as reservists. I think both of these amendments, uh, uh, my colleagues, will bolster our country's security, they will increase morale, they will make the work of those who are our country's first line of defense less stretched, more efficient, and thus able to support uh, the economies uh, in our communities across this nation. I hope that you will look at these two amendments and grant the necessary waivers. Thank you very much, Bob. You explained them very well. Did, have you run these by the committee? Have you, did you try and run this up with the Appropriations Committee, or are these uh, I have. I did not have the, uh, the uh, ability to do that. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Frost. Uh, sorry, I was temporarily out of the room. Uh, Mr. Filner, did you, is, uh, did you mention on your uh, amendment regarding the uh, National Guard and Reserve, is there a time period? Um, what period of time? Uh, how long can they serve and still have this differential paid? I think uh, as, as long as they're serving. So there is no max. You're not placing them in the right. max. Uh, and I don't know how long they're being called to duty for. Uh, I, we don't know either, I'm sure it's, it varies. And uh, again, uh, the heart, the, the incredible uh, testimony from family members who suffer yeah. uh, this incredible dis uh, loss of pay while they are serving their country, I'm not yeah. sure that we should reward the people in that, that way. But this would just single out uh, federal employees. And of course, at, there are a lot of people in the Guard this Reserve moment, who are not federal employees. This will allow, uh, right, I, I would urge, uh, you know, uh, this Congress to, uh, uh, to uh, urge the, the corporations and municipalities and other employers of this nation to do the same. Many are doing that voluntarily. The city of Chula Vista in my district 
is making up the difference between re, uh, city employees called into the uh, reserve and uh, their income. Uh, major, some major corporations are doing the same on a voluntary basis. Mm -hmm. uh, I would hope that uh, I would like to start somewhere where we have the direct authority, of yeah. course, and urge others to do the similar. Uh, a year ago, last April, um, I joined other members of the Texas delegation in visiting members of the Texas National Guard who had been called to active duty and who were stationed in Bosnia. Uh, and uh, this is not an easy proposition, uh, even under those terms, and that was not, there was no fighting involved, that was simply they were there in their role as peacekeepers. But they were, I talked to a number of them and they were concerned that in fact their jobs would be there when they return. These were people in the civilian sector. Um, and uh, in, in theory, their jobs are supposed to be there when they return. In fact, I called several of their employers when I got back and mentioned that I had uh, met these fine young people who were on active duty and wanted to make sure that their job would be there when they returned. Um, but of course, now that we're involved in, in a shooting war, um, these deployments, these uh, activations could be for a longer period of time. That was for a set period of time. It was either four or six months, I don't recall now. Um, and of course, uh, this is, and they face grave danger and uh, real concern to their families. Uh, I think this is an interesting amendment. Um, I would be surprised if the committee makes it in order. Uh, I would, uh, have, you, uh, have you made any effort to uh, have this added um, uh, to the defense authorization bill, of course, which is in conference now. We, we, are, we are trying to do this. Uh, it, it, these, this has come to our attention as, as of course, uh, all these matters do on uh, rather uh, short notice. Right. And, and the kind of processes that we have set up are difficult. So I've tried to, to, to shortcut that through this, uh, through this amendment. Uh, certainly we will be trying to make that case. This is not going to go away, as uh, Mr. Goss said about other matters. Uh, this is going to be with us, so we will try to find other mechanisms. I hope, Mr. Frost, also that you will look at the southern border amendment that I had for a rather s sh small amount of money. I believe that the border communities, for which you know very well, yes. whether they be in Texas or California, uh, are, are dying and need some immediate help and the help is not just grants or loans it's just to get that border crossing procedure made uh, quicker we can do it we can have the security and the quickness with more resources there is no question about that and there are lengthy delays at uh, almost all the major border crossing points in texas as well as california thank, thank you. you mr for us Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd just like to make a recommendation to Mr. Fildner, and that is that you uh, cost out you know, what this will be uh, by running it up with CBO in the case uh, in the future um, uh, you get an opportunity to uh, make the presentation again. I'm supportive of both the gentlemen's amendments, uh, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Thank you, sir. I'm advised we have a panel of the Honorable Donald A. Manzula of uh, Illinois and the Honorable Nidia Velasquez of New York. Is that, am I informed properly? That's good. Mr. Manzullo, pleasure to see you. Ms. Velasquez also. We all uh, prepared statements will be accepted without objection for the record, and further statements will be welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the committee. Uh, on behalf of myself as chairman of the Small Business Committee, as joined by Congresswoman Velasquez, who is the ranking minority member, we request that this committee do not waive points of order on sections 201 and 202 of Division B of the Fiscal Year 2002 Supplemental Appropriations Bill, which appear on pages 148 and 149 of H.R. 3338. Sections 201 and 202 violate House Rule 21 by authorizing on an appropriations bill and those authorizations fall within the jurisdiction of the Small Business Committee. Now, this chairman, uh, while the language uh, is a good first step, uh, I, as the chairman of the Small Business Committee, was never consulted uh, by the administration on this proposed language. The administration um, has taken a piecemeal approach to helping small businesses cope with the tragic events of September 11th the general downturn in our nation's economy. In contrast, however, the Small Business Committee in a bipartisan effort uh, 
passed two weeks ago a more comprehensive legislative package that not only includes these administration requests, but other initiatives that we received as input from the small business community to help them survive into the next year. It is my hope that the full House will soon be able to debate and vote on H.R. 3230, the American Small Business Emergency Relief and Recovery Act of 2001. That's the bill that we reported out of our committee just two weeks ago. Small businesses are the heart of our economy. They comprise over 50 percent of the private gross domestic product. They provide 75 percent of all the net new jobs that are created. Small businesses have historically brought this nation out of every previous economic downturn. We need a comprehensive approach to this crisis, not a bit-by-bit -bit response that only provides relief to a certain group of small businesses. And obviously, the committees of jurisdiction, uh, which is where we spend our time, uh, and we spend a lot of time on it, especially Mrs. Velasquez, who is from New York City um, and knows this subject intimately, that we have worked together on this very, very closely uh, to craft some good legislation and the bill we reported out two weeks ago. So what we're asking uh, is that the, that the Rules Committee uh, do not waive points of order on Sections 201 and 202. Secondly, uh, we're asking the Rules Committee, again, in a pi bipartisan uh, method, to make an order and amendment that we're offering that will allow the $140 million appropriated in this emergency supplemental to also go towards 7A and 504 loan programs of the Small Business Administration if not all the funds have been used for disaster relief. The initial appropriation of $100 million last September and this additional funding of $140 million is designed to support $1 billion in disaster relief. As of November 19th, the SBA approved $141 million in total disaster relief with only a fourth of that figure actually being dispersed. It's quite conceivable the SBA may not use the entire allotment provided in this appropriations bill. My amendment simply gives the SBA administrator the flexibility to use all these funds to provide additional relief to small business borrowers who use the same or who use the main lending programs of the SBA. That's the 7A General Business Loan Program and the 504 Certified Development Company Program. The $240 million set aside for the SBA and PL 107-38 and HR 3338 should be used to help as many, as many small businesses as possible, not for a shell game where it could be used to spend on other non-SBA programs sometimes later. Uh, so it's obvious what we're trying to do, and that is to take the commitment to use it for the small businesses. Uh, as, as this committee heard in the panel, of the New York members before us, uh, we're looking at uh, 10,000 small businesses that could be wiped out. The small businesses that were located within the Twin Towers compromised the fifth largest shopping center in the United States. Uh, the border store uh, that was in, in, the, in the basement was the largest border store uh, in the country. Uh, and there are literally uh, tens of thousands of people who are in desperate need of immediate financing from the SBA. Our amendment gives these tools to the administrator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. I appear before your committee in my capacity as the Ranking Democrat on the House Small Business Committee. And I'm concerned that containing the legislation before your committee are several provisions that make significant policy changes to the Small Business Administration's disaster loan program. These changes constitute authorizing on an appropriation bill a violation of House rules. While I am pleased that the proposal contained in H.R. 3338 attempts to address some of the issues that have developed as a result of recent events, I strongly believe that these matters should be dealt with not in a peace mill fashion as has been undertaken in this legislation, but as part of a comprehensive package that will ensure all businesses affected by the events of September 11th receive the assistance they need. Our committee has developed such a response 
with the passage of H.R. 3230, the American Small Business Emergency Relief and Recovery, Recovery Act of 2001. This legislation addresses the issues raised in sections 201 and 202 of the legislation before you, while providing this nation's small businesses with the access to capital and technical assistance they will need to weather this storm. I am concerned that adopting sections 201 and 202 separate from the other provisions of HR 3230 could end up doing more harm than good. It will expand program eligibility without making the corresponding program changes needed to accommodate these new participants. It is my hope that Chairman Manzullo and I will be back before this committee next week to ask you to make a, real, a rule in order to consider our bipartisan legislation. Mr. Chairman, our members have worked diligently on these issues. Out of deference to them, I will ask that you honor Mr. Manzullo's request and report a rule that allows our chairman to raise his point of order and to have the provision of section 201 and 202 removed from the legislation. I will also like to voice my support for Mr. Manzullo's amendment to ensure that if this language is retained in the base bill, the funding provided for in this legislation will be distributed fairly to all programs in need of this assistance. Mr. Chairman, let me say in closing, America's small businesses need a comprehensive assistance plan like the one we did for the airline industry and the one that we are currently working towards for the insurance industry, not the piecemeal approach contained in this legislation. It is my hope that you will provide a rule that will enable us to raise our point of order and have it dealt with in a proper manner. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, advised by staff that we have not had a lot of uh, background communication on this. And uh, normally what happens when you're talking what we informally refer to, I think, is the Army rule up here. I don't know what we called it before that. But uh, basically, uh, we, we uh, try not to have any uh, legislation on an appropriations bill unless it has the, the approval or the concurrence or at least the non-objection of the authorizing committee. So it would be very helpful if we could follow the format. Uh, and if you would ask your staff uh, to please send us a formal letter of your objection to that, uh, that gives us uh, a, a little bit better ability to deal with it the way we traditionally do. The second point, on, on a more uh, constructive note, rather than such a bureaucratic statement, uh, is have you, have you talked to the appropriators about this? Have you, have you sat down and had meetings with the appropriators of your staff, sat there and worked this stuff out? Because I, I see where we are and I see the conflict. I understand exactly what's going on. There's, what uh, I don't know is what staff background has gone into this. Well, it's, it's very difficult to answer your question. We had written to the, um, the cardinal uh, on this particular bill and requested that um, uh, these two sections not go in. Or, make a or are you suggestion? referring to the second part of our... Uh, no, I'm talking about the first part. I'm, I'm talking about the, the uh, legislation on appropriation. Mm -hmm. We had communicated with them, but they get a lot it, of it, it, is, it is my best advice to you at this late hour that you try and sort this out with the appropriators. I think that requires direct communication between chairmen to do that, and I would urge that you do that. Well, we, we've tried to do that. At uh, okay, well, I, I don't, Don, I don't want to uh, tell you how to do your business, but uh, I don't want to tell you how to do your business, but you're well, well in bounds to bring this. Okay, if that's the case, then would you file a formal letter of we'll objection? Thank you. Appreciate well, we would appreciate that. It would help. Mr. Frost. Mr. Frost. Mr. Frost. Thank you. I'm glad you came forward. We'll have the letter over here shortly. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Honorable Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas, I believe, next. Well, I'm, I'm taking them in the order that they show up here. We're trying to be fair in the rotation, and that's why we're doing it this way. I realize we're keeping an extremely important chairman waiting. <laughs> All chairmen well, I'm honored. are important. I'm honored. I'm honored, and I thank the distinguished uh, 
chairman and distinguished rule committee members for their patience and time uh, to allow me to comment on uh, two amendments uh, that I would like to lend my support for. Uh, first of all, Mr. Chairman, let me acknowledge coming from Texas uh, that we have experienced over our years certainly no tragedy comparable to the enormous impact of September 11th. Uh, but we are familiar with the normal natural disasters of hurricanes and uh, tornadoes and other circumstances that have required us in many instances to call upon the largesse and the compassion of the federal government. Just yesterday in my district, uh, I was able to present to our uh, one of our outstanding law schools, a $21 million check in response to the FEMA, uh, to the Tropical Storm Allison damage. That does not comport to the enormous loss of life in New York. So my first point, Mr. Chairman, is just to associate myself in support of the Lowy Sweeney Amendment, uh, particularly as it relates to the immediacy of their need. And just to briefly comment that during the weeks and days after September 11th. Many of us went to the floor of the House with a number of resolutions of sympathy and compassion, uh, expressing our understanding of the loss in New York. Many of us went to ground zero to experience firsthand for ourselves the deep pain. Just this last week before the Thanksgiving holiday, uh, this Congress passed HCON Res 228 legislation that I authored to prioritize the needs of children uh, who lost their parents in the September 11th tragedy. I only finally conclude as it relates to the Lowy Sweeney Amendment that I would hope that <clears throat> we would not make false promises and that we would in fact provide the necessary funds that New York needed. Let me go to the second uh, support that I'm here for, Mr. Chairman, and that is for the OB Amendment. In the last 24 hours, uh, the Houston metropolitan area received a notice from the Federal Bureau of Investigation regarding the threat posed to our oil refineries. The OB amendment is proactive. It involves funding for airport security. It involves funding for postal services. In particular, it responds to the large request that was made by the U.S. Postmaster General uh, dealing with the enormous costs that they have now experienced uh, because of the anthrax threat. Serving as a ranking member on the Immigration Subcommittee for the House Judiciary Committee can associate myself with the Filner Amendment that makes a request for $21, $20 million for border protection, but I also believe the OB Amendment must pass and must be made in order. Because, in fact, in addition to the delay that is going on at the border, one of the problems that we're facing is the inability to have the staff to utilize the biometric cards that have been put in place over the past two years. The OB Amendment would provide the additional funding and resources to assist us not only in the southern border, but additional funds for the northern border, the largest border that we have in the United States. The OB Amendment in particular also would address the question of contaminated water and contaminated food. Many of us have been working on homeland security issues for the past six weeks. And one of the issues that has not been addressed proactively by this Congress is how we avoid the contamination of our food and water. Just recently, the EPA has been doing research to determine what are the contaminants that contaminate our water. More resources are needed for the various municipalities and rural areas that have no protection for their water sources. And I would only say, Mr. Chairman, on the making an order of the OB Amendment, if we're going to face enormous threats around this nation, refineries in the state of Texas, and who knows what else in other parts of the country, other centers of commerce, then I think the nation will ask us, are we reactive or are we proactive? The OB Amendment asks for dollars now. It makes real the discussions we've been having on homeland security. In our respective airports, as we have passed the airport security legislation,
Much of the security has been taken up by overtime by local municipalities with their local law enforcement, police, sheriffs, and others. Those resources are straining our local municipalities, and particularly I note in the city of Houston. And these dollars would provide for reimbursement for those overtime utilization. I would hope that we would, in this instance, uh, accept the will of the American people with making in order the OB amendment as opposed to the mathematical calculations of the Office of Management and Budget. I think the American people want us to be proactive and not reactive. And I believe particularly that it is extremely important uh, that this Congress make good on its commitment and its emotion and its compassion and sympathy that we exhibited in the tragedy of September 11th. As we protect ourselves with the United States military, I believe it is extremely important to utilize this legislation to protect our homeland. And I thank the chairman and the committee for allowing me to offer testimony in support of the Obie Amendment and support of the Lowy Sweeney Amendment. I appreciate your statement. And if you have a written statement, I forgot to say, it will be, of course, accepted uh, without objection in the record. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. Mr. Ross. Good statement. And earlier today, I engaged in a conversation with uh, Mr. Obie about uh, Houston specifically and about uh, concerns about the Gulf Coast and about security of the oil industry and uh, um, this is a serious problem and mm -hmm. the, uh, the bill does not have enough money to address these concerns. So if, it's a good statement. Mr. Frost, if you would just yield for a moment, I'd appreciate it. You're, you're absolutely right. Let me just comment that as you well know that Houston has one of the larger ports mm -hmm. in the nation. Uh, our Coast Guard has been extremely burdened uh, by the responsibilities that it has. The OB Amendment would provide funding for the Coast Guard, provide safe passage, if you will, or safe protection for that area. And as I was leaving Houston today, uh, the FBI announcement uh, was um, causing uh, the organizing and the utilization of more of our local law enforcement without any knowledge of what to expect. Uh, I believe that we need the funding uh, to be uh, proactive and respond to those kinds of pronounced emergencies that we are getting notice of. So thank you. Thank you for your statement. Ms. Byron. Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Robert Mayor of Ohio. Distinguished Chairman, we welcome you. Uh, we are always glad to see you. I hope Bring so. good tidings, <laughs> I'm sure. Thanks. Um, appreciate your patience and uh, thank you. understanding in our rankings here. Well, I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, I want to thank you for allowing me uh, to testify tonight. I'm here today to express my concern about the language in H.R. 3338, the Supplemental Appropriations Bill that affects the operations of the U.S. House. Specifically, I have serious concerns about Section 803 of the bill, which would create a new Office of Emergency Planning, Preparedness, and Operations. I don't think I have to tell you how important that office is in lieu of September the 11th and everything that this House has gone through. First, you should know that the Committee on House Administration has already approved a proposal to create the Office of Emergency Preparedness, Response, and Recovery. The proposal was uh, submitted to the committee on October the 16th of 2001 by the officers of the House and approved. They uh, came over to the committee. We, of course, had, uh, as usual, interaction with uh, Mr. Hoyer, the ranking member, and there was no obje objection to approving this. So I want to make it clear, we did approve and authorize this to be created. The proposal was the result of the collective wisdom and evaluation of the officers of the House, as well as scrutiny and oversight of the committee, and was... Uh, and was uh, put together with uh, our approval. With the hindsight of being directly involved with many of the issues that arose as a result of the attacks of September the 11th, 2001. We have directed the officers to immediately begin efforts to implement this new office and to submit plans for the implementation to the committee for members review. Further, we have required monthly comprehensive status reports on the progress of this effort and anticipate holding oversight hearings to facilitate the bipartisan exchange of information as we work to make our capital a safer place for everybody. Obviously, it is not the concept of an Office of Emergency Planning, Preparedness and Operations uh, to which I am opposed tonight. What I am opposed to is the statutory construct 
in Section 803, which would allow the office to operate outside the jurisdiction of the Committee on House Administration. Sp specifically, the language in Section 803 proposes to empower the board it creates to appoint and set the annual rate of pay for employees of the House, including the director who shall head the office and carry out its operations under the supervision of the board. The authority given to the board circumvents the House Employees Position Classification Act, called HEPCA. That was created in 1978, and this U.S. House has operated since 1978 with House Administration having the jurisdiction with the House Employees Position Classification Act, and thereby the Committee on House Administration. The Committee challenges this language as an unacceptable delegation of authority that properly resides within the jurisdiction of the Committee on House Administration. This language, again, and I want to stress, we approved for this board to be created. It's important. It's important to every member, every staff, and every person visiting the Capitol because it reacts during an emergency. However, for the first time since 1978, the committee is totally stripped of any jurisdiction on procurement or the employee status. Further, the proposed language empowers the same board with the authority to approve procurement of services of experts and consultants by the House or by the office or by the committees or other entities of the House for assignment to the office. And that would be without our input. We as a committee, speaking for Mr. Hoyer and all the members on a bipartisan basis, as you know how we've operated, would not have the ability to have any type of input uh, in this unless we would like to do daily oversight hearings, which is not the way we have operated since 1978. The committee views this as an unacceptable grant of procurement authority outside of our jurisdiction. Currently, all consultant contracts must be reviewed and approved by the Committee on House Administration. In substance, by empowering the board unilaterally with this authority, the language in Section 803 precludes member involvement. Let me restate that. Precludes member involvement in an emergency board situation, and in particular precludes the members who serve on the Committee on House Administration that are expected by other members to be engaged and accountable for decisions involving the security of the U.S. Capitol. I can't tell you how many times since September the 11th that literally hundreds of staff and member requests, rightfully so, have come to the jurisdiction of our committee. Uh, it's happened to Mr. Hoyer, it's happened to myself and all the members of the committee. We've always uh, been proud uh, since January, but also after September the 11th, to respond in any way humanly possible to make sure that this Capitol operates safely. So I think this change is, is unprecedented in the members' ability to speak on an important issue that affects uh, the members and the staff for the security of the Capitol. Obviously, the recent terrorist attacks have caused us to take a harder look at our security operations in the House and re-examine how the Congress can continue to function effectively in the wake of disruptions caused by these incidences. These are obviously extraordinary times and they call for extraordinary action. The committee is prepared to take whatever action necessary to ensure this end and maintain the confidentiality of the process and decisions as appropriate. And we have always done it on a bipartisan basis. I have shared this information with Mr. Hoyer and we will continue to do that on a bipartisan basis. In addition to the substantive problems I have with Section 803, I'm also concerned about the manner in which it came into this bill. As I indicated, I've been in consultation with the officers about this new office and have approved a plan for its implementation. The officers sat in our committee and approved the way we authorized this to come about. That effort was undertaken through the proper channels with the involvement of the committee on a bipartisan basis on House administration. By contrast, Section 803 was drafted with zero, no input from our committee and was inserted into this bill without my knowledge, consent, we didn't even get a phone call. It clearly constitutes legislating on an appropriations bill, therefore, thereby rendering it subject to a point of order. I don't wish to take too much time uh, with the committee, so I'll wrap it up. Uh, make no mistake about it, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, with the exception of Section 803, I support this bill. And again, we have already authorized what this board wants to do. I oppose Section 803 both on procedural and substantive grounds. I'd like to see this language obviously stricken from H.R. 3338. I see also three ways, in my opinion, not trying to dare tell you uh, what to do, 
but I see three ways to accomplish this, and I would like to list them in order of preference. The Rules Committee strikes the language and reports H.R. 3338 without Section 803. The authorization has already been approved, so the Board goes into effect in the traditional way that it does under HEPCA rules since 1978. Failing that, since 803 clearly constitutes legislation on appropriations bill, I'd like to be able to raise a point of order against its consideration. If the committee decides not to strike the language, I would like to have a rule that would permit me to raise such a point of order against this section. Finally, as a last resort, I would like to be able to offer an amendment during floor consideration to simply strike section 803. I provided the committee with a copy of the amendment and would also ask that it be uh, made in order if uh, neither of my previous requests uh, could be granted. And again, uh, I want to thank you on behalf of all the members of House Administration for hearing me on this important issue. Thank you very much, Mr. Ney. You uh, make a, a valid, very compelling argument. And let me uh, thank you very much for your work, not only as, as chairman of the committee, but in the very important capacity that you've had, as you've said, uh, dealing with the important security needs of this institution, which uh, obviously have gotten a great deal of attention since September 11th. Mr. Goddess. No, I'd like to publicly uh, also comment that uh, I think that the work you've done has been extraordinary and very timely, yeah. obviously. Uh, we were definitely caught short after the 11th. We all know it. And I think you've uh, patched it up pretty well and come up with a good program. And uh, however it happens, uh, it's what we need. So mm -hmm. I give you credit Thanks. for it. I just also want to thank the gentleman because you've been extremely responsive, Bob, in everything that you've done, you and your committee, and it's been extremely helpful, and I know everybody appreciates it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, just as a member of the House Admin Committee, I just also want to join uh, Ms. Myrick in, in saluting uh, uh, Chairman Ney on what has been an extraordinary work effort that he has had to uh, uh, endure as the chair of this committee on, on some very trying circumstances. And uh, uh, as this works uh, itself through, uh, I think the importance of how he has held the diligence of uh, uh, handling uh, the affairs of uh, our uh, our premises uh, in the Capitol complex, as well as uh, the additional duties that the House Administration Committee uh, has put upon him this year with campaign finance election reform. He's done an extraordinary job with a, a new team on his staff and uh, the members on the House Admin Committee. I uh, hope that uh, the leadership of the Rules Committee can help resolve this uh, uh, matter. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could. Surely. I also want to say you have dancing partners. Mr. Hoyer has been excellent. And the members bipartisan, uh, on a bipartisan basis of this committee, including Mr. Reynolds and others, have just been uh, uh, tremendous uh, people that care about the safety of every single person uh, in this Capitol complex. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Ney. We appreciate your uh, being here and for your hard work. Thank you. Our uh, final witness is a very distinguished gentleman from Florida, a member of the Rules Committee, Mr. Hastings. Let me say that we are, appreciate your showing up for this testimony, Mr. Hastings, and we appreciate your having uh, spent the uh, afternoon and evening with us, and well, we look I thank forward you. to your remarks. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I shall be brief. I have two amendments, one that extends the period displaced workers can receive subsidized health care benefits from a period not to exceed 10 months or, or to a period not to exceed 18 months. And without further explanation, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman, I will offer uh, my full statement for the record. Um, uh, the second amendment that I uh, have offered is uh, one uh, that comes on the heels of uh, the work of Mr. Manzullo and Ms. Velasquez. Uh, the Small Business Administration estimates that $600 million in low interest loans is needed to help small businesses recover from the economic losses they've experienced since September the 11th. Um, uh, the measure, as I offer it, uh, uh, the bill itself provides a mere $140 million in additional funds for the SBA uh, to use for low-interest disaster loans to American businesses. Um, this allows for a $460 million shortfall, and my amendment increases the supplemental appropriation to the SBA by $460 million to help American businesses during these hard times. And that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Hastings. You've made it uh, very clear, Mr. Glass. Mr. Chairman, I apologize for not being here earlier in the day because obviously a lot of things have gone on since we last talked about this over the break. And 
Um, my concern is I mean, everybody has brought very important matters to the attention of the Rules Committee. My worry is that now we have redefined defense to mean stop anything bad from happening, you know, whether it's this, that, or the other. And I, I think we've got to remember we're doing an appropriations bill for the Department of Defense. But that doesn't mean that we haven't got to find a way to deal with the kinds of problems that you brought to us. Right. So, I mean, that's the only observation. If I, I could made. just respond, uh, Porter, the, the measure regarding the Small Business Administration is in the bill. I understand. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. All right. Things have been happening. Oh. All right. Mr. Frost, Mrs. Myrick, Mr. Reynolds. Let me just say that uh, you, you've uh, made uh, compelling argument, uh, Alcy, and we appreciate your doing that. And, and Porter is right. I mean, this really is the Department of Defense Appropriations Bill, and it's designed to deal with our national security needs. But we know that in addition to the Department of Defense Appropriation, we have the funding that is designed to, to address this problem. Obviously, we have had uh, a wide range of issues uh, that have come before this committee uh, in the last several hours. And it's going to be a few minutes before we fashion the rule, probably um, about an hour or so. And as I've just informed Mr. Frost, we will be uh, giving a half an hour notice to the members before we... Okay, I'm just told to say that the hearing portion is concluded, but I was going to say that um, when we recess. Thanks for telling me, though, that Matt. Getting a good start there, Matt. Um, He's <clears throat> good. And so it's our, uh, our plan to um, recon give a half an hour's notice to uh, the minority members before we reconvene. And uh, we obviously hope that uh, we'll be able to do it before too terribly long. Mr. Frost. Mr. Chairman, um, will we uh, be considering the insurance legislation uh, tomorrow? Well, the plan right now is to uh, have the, uh, the reinsurance measure, uh, we hope, on the floor later this week. I don't know if we've actually put on the schedule. Notice for 2 o'clock tomorrow. Yeah, 2 o'clock tomorrow is when we've just uh, sent out the notice for the hearing tomorrow on the uh, reinsurance bill. Mm -hmm. Do we anticipate any other matters in the Rules Committee this week? Well, <clears throat> it's quite possible that we could have some conference reports. Uh, and we hope uh, later this week that, that uh, we'll be able to have some conference reports that we'll consider here and then possibly have on the floor at the end of the week. Mm -hmm. But we, we don't know at this point. Well, I don't think we have the conference reports completed yet, but we're hoping that they will be. I know that the conferees are working diligently to try and uh, bring uh, some of those conferences to conclusion. So we're hoping that as soon as they do, we'll be able to schedule a meeting time for this committee and, mm -hmm. and then consider them, we hope, before the end of the week. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman, the, uh, if I recall correctly, the, uh, the CR expires on the 7th? The 7th, correct. Um, which would I presumably mean that we will be taking up another CR sometime next week. Well, <clears throat> I mean, the, Certainly, we would hope to have the work of this session of Congress completed by the 7th, but I think the gentleman's safe to conclude that we, there's a chance that we will not. And I if, think if I saw a statement from the yeah. majority leader oh, to know. that effect uh, earlier today. Yeah. 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 I know you're, you're, you're correct, but we uh, always hold out hope that we might be able to complete our work by the time that the continuing resolution is scheduled to expire, which, as you said, is on the 7th. Uh, assuming that that does not happen, uh, we will plan to meet sometime uh, next week, and uh, I, don't, I don't know what the length of the next continuing resolution would be, but uh, we, again, want to, we have a number of priority items that we want to get addressed, and at that juncture, it'll primarily be appropriations bills. There had been an earlier announcement before we left for Thanksgiving mm -hmm. that the uh, fast-track legislation would be up next week. Is that still planned? Trade Promotion Authority is going to be voted on the floor on Thursday, December 6th. Mm -hmm. That's next week? Yes, the end of next week. Mm -hmm. That's on the schedule, and I've been in a number of meetings today at which this has been discussed, and we're planning to consider Trade Promotion Authority on Thursday, and I'm looking forward to getting this authority to the President so he can once again reaffirm his very important leadership role in the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, authority that requires passage by both the House and the Senate. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Thank you. And with that, the uh, hearing stands uh, concluded, now that I've officially said that, and the committee stands in recess, subject to the call of the chair. Thank you all.
The House is expected to take up the Defense Department Appropriations Bill tomorrow. Live House coverage on our companion network, C-SPAN. Ahead on C-SPAN 2 tonight.